Good evening, good morning, wherever you may be around the globe, in the chat room, on another planet, or on the other side. This is Late Night in the Midlands, and I am Michael Vera. Folks, I welcome you all, wherever it is you may be. And uh, by the way, this broadcast is coming at you live from the capital city, Columbia, South Carolina, on the east coast of the United States. And yes, we are absolutely live. Folks, I am uh, unable to uh, participate in the chat room tonight, unfortunately. Uh, well, I kind of, well, let's just say a password got thrown on the computer. Um, and, uh, well, somebody, I won't mention no names, but somebody doesn't remember the password. And I found out kind of 20 minutes before showtime, so... We will uh, we'll get that taken care of, and I will definitely uh, be in that chat room tomorrow. It's just uh, I could run it on my broadcast computer here, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to take any chances of uh, screwing up uh, the broadcast itself. So uh, that's always separate for me with the chat room. So, folks, tonight, I'm sorry. I will not be in chat, so I cannot get your questions and stuff that way. So what I would ask is that if you do have questions or comments tonight, that you actually pick up the phone or Skype and call in. Uh, so that's how, how that's how it'll have to be tonight if if we're going to do this. Uh, so in any case, uh, folks, get over to the website late night in the Midlands dot com. Go on them. <laughs> Uh, get over to late night in the Midlands dot com. Become a <laughs> become a member and be informed. She feels so bad. Uh, again, I'll mention no names, uh, folks. But uh, yeah, if you could subscribe and donate, that would help us out tremendously. Uh, becoming a late nighter not only helps keep us on the air, but it helps keep you informed. Um, We've already got a newsletter that goes out. Uh, you could get, you could sign up for the uh, newsletter uh, on our website over on late night in the Midlands .com. I haven't really talked about that much lately, uh, but there is a newsletter, and you can you could sign up, put your email in, and uh, you'll get our latest postings uh, each and every morning. I think. Uh, is how it's set up. And, uh, well, that's free. So is the chat room. Unfortunately, I'm not there tonight, <clears throat> Autumn. But, uh, um, yeah, so, but there is with the subscriptions. I mean, you get access to the forums. You get access to the archives. You get access to, well, you get access to uh, insider videos. And, well, of course, I'm easily accessible as well. Most nights, anyhow. Uh, but still easy tonight. All you got to do is call in. Um, so, anyhow, I've got some news I want to get into. And so we'll do that now. We'll take our break. And, of course, we'll come back with our guest, who, by the way, is David Serrata. Uh, he is going to be with us tonight. Um, he says that he's got some... Pretty substantial information to share with us tonight, so uh, I'll be looking forward to talking with David tonight. I think it's been a while since he's been on. Might be over a year since I've had David on. See, I'm telling you, folks, we're not like some of those other shows. We don't, you know, sometimes guests don't get back here for a while. It's just because we, I mean, since we've started, we've had such a long list of people. I mean, really, we have. I'm not gloating or anything. I'm just saying that. I mean, there's so many important people out there. I can't understand why some of these shows out there only pick people who are famous and popular and got bestsellers. And, uh, that's, I guess that's just the way they roll, right? Runaway sea level rise, collapsing coastlines, and the chemical climate engineering assault. This one come from our good friend Dang Wigington from uh, Geoengineering Geoengineering Watch, I believe. Let me make sure I get that right. Uh, yeah, geoengineeringwatch.org. Folks, I have sometimes I have trouble remembering what foot to put my shoes on, for crying out loud, and remembering everybody's websites, really. But um, the current condition of the climate and Earth's life support systems is not as bad as we have been told, he says. It is... 
tremendously worse. Global climate engineering is the, uh, well, it's damaging our planet uh, big time. And he's got quite an article here that you can go check out. We've, uh, uh, he sent in an email. He's always given me permission to repost. So occasionally when something comes through that I think is really substantial I, and I have time, I share it. Uh, abrupt climate shift. Uh, he's talking about shattering all kinds of records and, you know, it talks about the melting ice and the thermal expansion, the global warming lies. So go check it out over on late night in the Midlands dot com under news and discovery. Here's another one. I don't know if you would believe or not. It says Indian jet shoots down UFO over Rajasthan. Rajasthan, I think that is the incident which occurred yesterday morning is already being referred to as India's Roswell. Well, if that's the case, then we know that this UFO deal here was just a cover up for what probably was the real one. And who knows, might have been American pilots sitting in the seats there or something. I don't know. According to the Indian Air Force, however, the object, which was described as suspicious, was intercepted by a fighter jet after showing up on radar over the Barmer district near the border with Pakistan. And so they say that uh, the area was later investigated by local law enforcement agencies, which recovered a selection of cone-shaped objects from the crash site and sent them to the Air Force officials for analysts. Um, They said between 10.30 and 11 a.m. on Tuesday, January 26th, an unidentified balloon-shaped object was picked up by the Indian Air Force, said a spokesman uh, for the IAF radar. Well, of course they're going to say that because that's what they're supposed to say. Now, they are saying, though, uh, people who witnessed this say whatever the object was, it seems unlikely to have been a weather balloon. So here we go, uh, this time uh, not in the U.S., but uh, in India, a Roswell-type incident, balloon, UFO. You know, these stories, they, they don't do anything for me anymore. They really don't. Because, I mean, all it really does is makes me analyze maybe who's behind it altogether. But, I mean, when it comes down to it, I know that there's extraterrestrials. And I know that they visited this this planet. I also know that the various governments, including our own here in the United States, have reverse engineered these technologies and that they have them as well. So... You know, who knows what they shot down. They're going to keep a secret. Free energy. I said it a long time ago. That one of the big reasons they don't want to tell us about this technology is because, well, then we wouldn't be slaves to the oil companies. That's why. Oh, anyhow, scientists create first monkeys with autism gene in hope of a breakthrough. Yeah, how about that? So researchers hope that genetically creating monkeys, so genetically modified everything nowadays, folks, and people say, well, we, 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 would you, I, we had a conversation today. Would you like to live to the end of the world? I mean, would you like to be alive and see the end of the world? I'm like, I have news for you. I might be alive to see the end of the world. Look what's happening. Genetically modified monkeys with a gene linked to autism will give them a better understanding of the disorder. Well, you know, here's what I say about this whole thing, and it's linked up on LateNightInTheMidlands.com, so you could go check it out for yourself. I say this, and I wrote this down in, uh, or typed this up in this story uh, for Michael Vera's comment, because some of these, these, when I post stuff like this, sometimes I have to leave a comment with it, because I don't want you to think that I don't know what's really going on, because I do. And, you know, I I wrote here, and I'll say just in my own words, what else have they tested on? Children. That's right. They have. They've they've tested on children. Um, Talking about, uh, of course, the um, vaccines and and the, the ingredients and the strands of whatever that they put in these vaccines. And they cover their tracks every step of the way. Um, but they have. They do it on a daily basis with these vaccinations, through vaccinations. 
And uh, they say that the results of the autism epidemic now facing as many as one in 45 American children, this is according to a new government study. But then, like I say in, in this article, that would be like asking a drug company to see their studies rather than an independent study before taking their drugs. See, this is what happened when after my heart attack, they put me on these statins. Well, you know, for about six months, I did their garbage. And then I started doing my own research on these statins. And, you know, after I think J.H. was in the chat room and a few others had mentioned to me, you know, don't take them, stop. And so I said, well, let me, you know, because that, that's the best thing you could do, research for yourself. Well, I did. And it turns out that any of the studies that came from the actual drug company show positive results. But the independent studies, and there was plenty of them, show that not only do statins not lower your cholesterol, there's no evidence whatsoever of them lowering your cholesterol at all, uh, but that they cause all kinds of other problems, such as weakening your heart. And aren't you taking this crap so that you don't have a heart attack, right, or a stroke? And that's So anyways, getting back on topic here, um, yeah, they, they do these tests on children. I, you you know they're, they're the monkeys. I think is just a smokescreen for you and me. The truth of the matter is, is they're doing they're doing worldwide studies right now. Every time they give vaccines to these children, it's the truth. I know, and some of you, I sound like some crazed maniac. You know, right? Like, oh my God, this guy, uh, he, he must have took too much LSD or something, right? That's what you think. You know, because it just sounds crazy. Our government, American government, do this to their own people? <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's a little pill, um, and uh, they say that it could protect people from AIDS. And there's this one little city um, that thinks that their epidemic of AIDS could be ending because of this pill. And uh, I guess the word, it's called P-R-E-P, PrEP. That's uh, That's the word for this remedy of pill that you would take to protect yourself from the HIV virus. I'll just tell you what they say, and then I'll give you my own thoughts on this. Uh, they say those four letters, P-R-E-P, stand for a daily medical uh, regimen in which healthy individuals take a blue oval pill to lower their risk of becoming infected with HIV. The treatment known as pre-exposure prophylax has become so common in the Bay Area's gay community that it's frequently mentioned in social media profiles from Facebook to Scruff. Well, you know, judging by the government that we've had, these alphabet agencies, Big Pharma, all the evil entities and what they do, I wouldn't doubt if they're putting HIV in these pills. So, you know, really, I mean, you think, well, who better? And here's people who are willing to take risks. They got a little blue pill now they could take, or whatever color it is. Take your little pill, and you'll be okay. You can go do whatever you want with whoever you want. You don't have to worry, right? Because, hey, it could give me up to 90% protection. Oops, unlucky me. I must have been part of that 10%. Oh, well, I have AIDS, right? Is that it? They say since the first breakthrough research was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, the once-a-day dose of uh, Truvada has constantly been shown to reduce the risk of HIV infections by as much as 90%. The results of most recent study, uh, which was published in September, were even more encouraging, they say, not one of the 600 people taking the drug became infected over two years. So did they purposely send these 600 people to have sex with somebody who had AIDS, I wonder? I mean, I don't know. What's going on behind their curtains I, to do these studies? I just, I'm curious. Um, but I would say another case of create the problem and sell the solution. You know, only the joke is on the people because... They have had the cure to to this man-made disease for a very long time. Dr. Leonard Horowitz uh, can certainly educate you on that. I'll get him on here. We'll talk about it one of these nights. Um, so they're making more money keeping you sick. And in this case, you're paying the gang for protection, right? 
That's basically what you're doing. They're, they're basically, they, they have the cure for AIDS. Come on. I, I'm done with these games that they play. They've got the cure for AIDS. You know, but they, they want to be, hey, tell you what, pay us, meaning, you know, buy our little pill, and we won't give you AIDS, maybe. Right? I mean, so it's just ridiculous. It's it's just another another scam. Another scam. You, know, you could pay for more of their underground bunkers and their weapons of mass destruction against you. Uh, did climate change kill the aliens? Well, I don't know, but there's a good story uh, we linked up on Late Night in the Midlands for you. If you want to go check it out, it is there for you. And they're saying that climate change on these other planets could have wiped out the ETs like it's, well, might wipe us out. Well, there's, a, again, a good environmental story uh, for you there if you want to uh, get into it. Antidepressants can raise the risk of suicide. Biggest ever review find. See, now you didn't need a review for this because I've told you, Iris told you, Ryan's told you, Rascala, uh, Peter Kling, everybody really has told you that antidepressants do raise the risk of suicide. In these sick commercials that they play on TV, uh, you know, they tell you this. Uh, if you've had, tell, tell your doctor if you've had thoughts of suicide. Really? Tell your doctor if you've had thoughts of suicide. Well, he'll up your dosage, and you'll definitely commit suicide. Uh, Antidepress. Look, if you're depressed, there's something in your life that's making you depressed. Figure out what that is and exclude it from your daily activities, and you will no longer be depressed. A pill is not going to help you. All right, it's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you more. In the long run, it's going to hurt you more. These drugs are designed to hurt you, not help you. I no longer, I have no faith in the medical community no more. And big pharma, I never have. Maybe when I was a kid. No faith in them at all. There's always a catch to all this stuff. Antidepressants, they cause the depression. They're, they're probably, that's why there's such an, uh, an epidemic of depressed people. They're, they're causing it. They're doing it through everything, through mass media, through, I mean, my God, they got so many ways to zap you and depress you. And then, of course, they come up with the solution. Here's a little pill. Oh, and if we're lucky, you'll kill yourself, right? It's just, and then your family will be depressed because you died, and they'll be on these pills. And, well, you know, you see the cycle, right? I know, I'm just an arrogant, you know, whatever, right? I'm just, but I'm telling you the truth. Oh, by the way, um, they're saying that the, the expected outbreak of the Zika from mosquitoes, the Zika virus. Um, I just want to remind people that back on December 7th of 2012, I came on air and I, I, and I posted on our website a story and the title was Florida scientists prepared to release hundreds of of thousands of genetically modified mosquitoes. I reported on this. I think I actually I broke it open uh, back in December of 2012. I don't think a lot of people took me very serious. I think they, you know, because you get guys like Alex Jones out there, before you know it, you know, you start classifying everybody as, as fear-mongering, and no, that's not the case, okay? I told everybody about these genetically modified mosquitoes and how they were released in parts of Florida, and they were also released in Brazil, and they were released in the Caribbean islands. I told people back in 2012, I said, you watch, this is going to be a problem, and it is. Massachusetts health officials confirmed the state has its first case of Zika. The Zika virus has similar symptoms to that uh, dengue and a, another one, I'll try it here, uh, chikagania, I think it's called. So, yeah, it's all the same. And Los Angeles uh, County, Minnesota, uh, they've, they've got uh, their first cases of it. Arkansas, Virginia, they've got their first cases of it. There it is. It's, it's re- this is an attack. This is an attack on America. It really is. And all our neighbors. I mean, really, it's attack on the, on the population is what it truly is. Zika is linked to babies being born with undeveloped brains. Wow, you think that's an accident? Do you think that's an accident? And you think I'm exaggerating when I say that they experiment on children. 
this is designed to do this. This is this is no accident, folks. This is genetically modified mosquitoes doing exactly what they were put out there to do, honestly. And it's spreading through the Americas. By the way, they say that Zika symptoms in adults and children include flu-like aches, inflammation of the eyes, joint pain, and rashes, although some people have no symptoms at all. But um, pregnant women at the highest risk because it makes babies uh, be born with undeveloped brains. Isn't that what they want? A population of undeveloped brains. I think I think it is. I think that's what they're aiming for. I'm Michael Vera. This is Late Night in the Midlands. Just saying it like it is, folks. We'll be back in just a few minutes. This is Dick Farrell here to tell you about OxySilver, legally available only through CureShop.com and HealthyWorldStore.com. Don't be fooled buying silver products from copycats and criminals. You've heard Dr. Leonard Horowitz and experts urge you to avoid deadly vaccinations and illegal operators selling stolen OxySilver and OxySilver copycats. You've heard experts tell you about suppression in alternative medicine and confusing propaganda in healthcare and the truth movement. Read Dr. Horowitz's book, Healing Celebrations, to learn how miracle healings can be made to happen through faith, prayer, and a pure diet. Get great immunity using vitamin C, D, and oxy silver, liquid dentist, GI Flora Pro, a top shelf probiotic. Use Green Harvest as a great tasting meal substitute for energizing organic nutrients and losing weight. And Zeola, and natural clays for detoxifying your body. More advice, all these products and more are available from thecureshop.com including Oxy Silver, the world's most powerful silver hydrosol. Electro-energized to put risky injections, toxic antibiotics, and deadly drug pushers out of business. Oxy Silver is covalently bonded to water, unlike any other silver product using the frequency of chlorophyll 528, what Dr. Horowitz explains is pure tone love, the universal healer. NASA originally developed covalently body silver hydrosols to keep astronauts healthy in space. Dr. Horowitz added the 528 frequency to NASA's formula and more. Oxy Silver works three ways to electrocute dangerous germs better than anything, far better than all leading silver products and without any risk. Oxy Silver oxygenates and resonates with 528 for faster healing. So help save lives putting drug lords and criminals out of business and keep the LNM network broadcasting. Register for our free cooperative at healthworldaffiliates.com forward slash 4948. That's healthyworldaffiliates.com forward slash 4948. And buy Oxy Silver and other great products in package specials at great discounts from the cureshop.com buy oxy silver gi flora pro green harvest zeolove and love minerals at great discounts at cureshop.com that's cureshop.com with two p's c-u-r-e-s-h-o-p-p-e.com or call toll free at 1-888-621-7611 that's 1-888-621-7611 do it now late night in the midlands we're building a bridge to the truth and beyond Share our content and use the hashtag LNM Radio for your chance to win a free subscription. Those who use it at least 10 times a month will find themselves entered into a drawing every month to win a free two-month subscription from Late Night in the Midlands. So spread our news, spread our website, and use hashtag LNM Radio. The LNM Radio Network offers a moderated chat room at www.latenightinthemidlands.com. Just click the chat and listen page from the drop-down menu at the top of any page on the website or click the listen live button at the top of the homepage at www.latenightinthemidlands.com. Is there proof of God's existence in our government's records? Author Jose Colazzo brings his years of research into this stunning question to light with his new book. Discover how new and 
experimental technologies may change our world forever and uncover monumental proof and answers to mankind's greatest questions in God Does Exist. No more nuclear testing and more. You could find Jose Colazo's book, America's New Slavery, on Amazon.com. This show is for the mentally sane and for those who accept an alternate reality to the lie you have been told. If you're politically correct, politically brainwashed, or politically insane, then I recommend you turn the dial immediately and go back to the lies and distorted reality that makes you feel secure in your unsecure life. We cover everything should not be mistaken for we go along to get along. We are not those other shows who guide you down a dark hall because seeing is not beneficial to their bottom line. No, we turn a light on so you can truly see what lies ahead. We are not alternative, but if we were, then we would be an alternative to the lies, not the news, because sometimes the alternative is no better. We are independent. We are LNM, and we are saying it like it is. LNM Radio, exposing the truth, one show at a time. Attention, LNM Radio Network listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the LNM Radio Network by calling 605 562 4203? No smartphone app or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 605-562-4203 to listen to the LNM Radio Network on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Become a late nighter without the late nights. And subscribe now to help Late Night in the Midlands bring you the best guests with the best information. Hey, late-nighters, I have a secret I want to share with you. What if I told you there's a way to hear some of our show content free on YouTube? Well, it just so happens there's a guy who is honest and supports Late Night in the Midlands big time. And he owns a YouTube channel I highly recommend. Non-Human Entities. Yes, non-human entities, and if you do not have a pencil handy, no sweat. You can just click one of the many banners on our website. Non-human entities, that's non-human entities. Again, just look for them on YouTube or click the banner on LateNightInTheMidlands.com for non-human entities. Imagine, if you will, a man, a media speaking the truth imagine a show that covers UFOs ET races the paranormal and the not so normal a media that speaks the truth no matter who or what it leads to imagine if you will a media that covers everything (laughs) folks you just entered LNM Zone. LNM, keeping it real when others don't. On the east coast of the United States, from the capital city, Columbia, South Carolina, you're listening to Late Night in the Midlands with your host, Michael Vera. To talk to Michael Vera, dial 803-392-4566 or around the world on Skype. Just use Skype ID LNM Radio. Okay, we are back. This is Late Night in the Midlands, and I am Michael Vera. Folks, I welcome you all again, wherever it is you may be. I want to give a quick shout-out to our radio affiliates, K98 Talk. Hold your head up, because uh, you're running us. And you know what? Hats off to you. SHR Media and Pundit Press, thank you to all of you. High Point Radio, the top of New Jersey, covering New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania on 1620 AM and 100.5 FM. Hold your heads up. Uh, And, of course, Voice of Onset Harbor Radio in Wareham, Massachusetts on WAFR 87.5 FM 
And uh, will you all just hold your heads up too? Because you know it's not it's not popular. You've got to be a yes man to uh, you know. Thankfully, the mom and pop stations are out there still. Some of them, and uh, those are the ones uh, who really take the interest. Uh, but boy, those those big ones. I believe me, I've contacted many of them, and you know this. Oh, well, let me take a listen. You got a good show, but, you know, you can't be talking about the president like that. You can't be. Are you kidding me? I mean, so that's basically what it comes down to. So to get anywhere, it seems like you've got to be a yes man. And so I'm never going to get nowhere. I'm always, and which, of course, in their eyes. I mean, I think some people, they judge success by uh, dollars and by, I don't know, uh, maybe by their following. But you know what? If you put Late Night in the Midlands on 500 stations across this country, man, I really think it'd be some kind of revolution, uh, to be honest with you. So they're not going to do that. And, you know, you've got to be... like I mean, you look at... And I don't want to start bashing anybody. And you, you look at Nori. I mean, there's, that wasn't his show. He was hired. He was hired to do... I mean, that's like any of you. If you were hired to do that job, you do what they ask you to do. It's different when you build your baby. And so I, I don't want to talk about her, but I mean, even Heather, I mean, over there on Dark Matter, she was given that show. So, you know, for me, I built this baby. This means something to me. And uh, I won't let nobody change it. Now, those those guys over there, the mother ones, they'll, they will let changes be made because they just want to have, they want to have their voice on the air. They want to, you know, they want to receive whatever pay they get. I don't, I don't roll that way. So, you know, I, I just say it like it is. And sometimes, sometimes that knocks, you know, that really does tear bridges down for me, in which I don't care. Um, you know, but, but it does, it does. I mean, sometimes there'll be guests who are signed to come on and, you know, they get a pretty big scoop over there on coast to coast. And sometimes, you know, the coast people find out that they're coming over here, and you might say, well, why would they worry about you? Well, because we had a battle over Richard Hoagland not long ago, and, you know, that's where it went. And so many guests have been warned not to come on my show and stuff. It happens. Some of them take their advice. Now, why? I don't know. I don't think you could ever find a show where I've um, attacked my guest, outside, unless, you know, there has been a couple where they were total BS, and so they had to be, you know, told that. But, I mean, other than that, it's not happened that way. All right, so let me, I'm going to try. I've, I've, I was supposed to have David Serrata on tonight. Now, he's been on this show many times before. So, I'll tell you what, I'll give it one more try here. And we'll see if we can get David on with us. And if so, we'll get a background and such from him. And we'll see how it goes. Oh, I think we got him. David. Hey. Hey, welcome aboard, my friend. How are you? Good, good. I didn't know if we were going to get you or not uh, tonight. I didn't know. Uh, it, it showed that you weren't online. I saw. <laughs> but uh, well, I've, been, I've been online for a while now. That's weird. Huh. Okay, well, yeah, it shows you. It shows that you're not. Maybe it's. Uh, maybe you haven't accepted my um, uh, my my Skype friend request, whatever it is there. Uh, maybe that's. Oh, L O N M. Yeah, there was one that. See, if you don't put anything in the subject line, I I can't tell. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, who I, it is. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but uh, hey, I, I welcome you aboard. It's been a while since you've been on, and oh uh, yeah, a long time. Yeah, it has been way too long, uh, David. So uh, I thought maybe we could start out with a little bit of background. Um, I kind of foiled on the on the uh, bio here because I didn't I, honestly I didn't see you on there, so I didn't think I didn't know if we were going to get you uh, right away. So, but uh, welcome aboard, and and yeah, a little little background, and then you said that uh, uh, that you had some new astounding information. So maybe we can get into that too. Yeah, I've been, you know, my background really, it, it goes all the way to the 1960s when I was growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area and I saw a flying saucer with a massive impact. All the people were going crazy on the streets over it. And um, I started having contact with the ETs behind sleep who were from Pallades and they started showing me how the craft worked from the inside. And 
And you have to understand that in those days, there was no such thing as UFOlogy for kids where you could just go, hey, you know, you can come and talk to us about your experience. I mean, we didn't have the X Files. We had My Favorite Martian, which was a, <laughs> which was a comedy. <laughs> I remember that. It's one of my favorite shows, actually. I, in fact, my uh, my little daughter, who's five now, watches um, My Favorite Martian with me from time to time. It's a pretty funny show. So it, it all starts from there. And then by the time, you know, I, I grew up in the Bay Area during the 60s and the riots and the Vietnam protests. My mom divorces my dad, who's getting his Ph.D. in psychology in Berkeley, because the 60s were pretty wild times. And she married a, a military man who became a science teacher, David Cooper. And he raised me and my brothers for, there's five of us for seven years. And then I, my mom sent us back to be raised by our real father. And he got me into yoga and meditation and in you know, different Indian mystics and studying religious, you know, ideas from all over the world. I started practicing meditation and expanding my consciousness. By the time I was 18, I was meditating every single day. So I'm deeply influenced by science, and I'm deeply influenced by by consciousness, and how the two of them can kind of come together. And you know, with that, um, I've had so many mystical experiences. I I went through a period after some blinding apparitions of Christ, where Christ surprisingly appeared to me, because I was doing mostly yoga and, and practicing meditation, and the visions of Christ were so blinding and powerful. I I uh, ended up writing a book on it called Face to Face with Jesus Christ and then I started he started teaching me uh, literally about the atom and how consciousness cooperatively creates and co-creates the universe and what the real meaning of many of the deep scriptures were and now I've slowly over the years I've read almost every missing or hidden gospel there is many of which some people have never even heard of um, like the Acts of John, and I've studied Buddhism intensely, Hinduism intensely, and what, what you start to find in all the great religions of the world is there. there's a cosmic connection to flying saucers and UFOs in most of them. You know, like in Hinduism, you have the Vimanas, the Vimanas, the flying craft, and you have the chariots of the gods in you know in the Roman and the Greek systems, mm -hmm. and gods being like Zeus being literally from way above the human race, and their ability to move around and exist in other dimensions is is way beyond what we can even understand now, and even in in the in the old the, you know the first prophet in the Bible is Enoch, and Enoch has a vision where God comes down and literally what appears to be a crystalline spaceship with the two angels, Michael and Gabriel, at his side, and it lands on the ground. Enoch falls flat upon his face because of the blinding rays of light of God and the power of God. And, um, and you know, from, from the point of, of this particular God, I mean, I, I think there's some confusion in the translation about who is the real true God and and who isn't, and who who are the gods in the Old Testament of war, and who are the gods of peace. And they really got fused together into one personality, and that has caused huge controversies in what the God of the Old Testament really advocates. And I, I think a lot of the ideas of religious and holy wars come from the misunderstanding of who, interpreting scripture and old old writings and who's really talking to the real god and who isn't well i'll, there, I'll be honest yeah. with you david when i when i look at uh you know the the uh holy bible and i i read some of that stuff it really sounds like a really angry god um, exactly because you're getting there's times when like for example when when god appears to adam and eve in the garden which is really almost like a parable God is warning them not to take in the knowledge of good and evil. And Jesus explained this to me in person, and it's been grossly misinterpreted because God says don't ever take in the knowledge of good and evil because good and evil is judgment, right? And it's also conflict. As soon as you ingest a conflict, you, be, you go into a state of conflict, and then you think you know what's right and what's wrong, and it's always different than the other guy or the other woman, and everybody's fighting over who's got the thing right and who has it wrong. And that's the poison. The knowledge of good and evil is judgment. 
And judgment causes conflict and arguments which ultimately lead to wars. And then you get the idea that there's a God in the Old Testament who stands behind the wars and sends people into battle. And there's a particular phrase in the in the Christian the New Testament, and this is canonized New Testament, where Jesus removes himself from the angry God of the Old Testament. And he's telling the Jews that you're worshiping the wrong God. You're not you're no longer worshiping the God who came. He said before Abraham, I was I am. He said before Abraham was I am. And see, the I am that I am is is the the presence of God that appeared to Moses. And the I am that I am is the same as the Atman in Hinduism, which is the supreme I am and I am Ness, which is pure peace consciousness. And Jesus is telling this group of Jews that that basically you, the one you're worshiping has was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. I mean, this is in the Bible. I just don't have that particular passage in front of me. And that passage has disturbed many Christians because Jesus is saying that your father, whom you're calling in the Old Testament, is not my father. I'm not part of him. And that's really explained in the Gnostic Gospels, where we see in the Apocryphon of John, Jesus calls the god of war, he calls him Yaltabaoth. And Yaltabaoth sounds a little bit like Yahweh or Yahweh, which you don't really pronounce according to the Bible. And so there's there's definitely a turn of events where there's, when Jesus says before Abraham was, I am, he's referring to, the I am that I am that appeared to Moses and the the in the burning bush incident. And he's referring to the true presence of God and the God that warned Adam and Eve, don't take in this knowledge of good and evil because it's going to lead to wars. You're going to go into a state of conflict. You can't solve the riddle of the knowledge of good and evil because there's no one who, see, it's a poison. It makes you think you're right and the other guy's wrong. And that's the poison. And that's... <laughs> That's why every religion gets divided, 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 and everybody's fighting. Everybody says, my version is right. But see, when you go to the Enoch story, you, you get the vision of the crystalline flying saucer and God landing on the ground. And then you see Noah, and you see the idea that God is going to save, is going to try to warn humanity that there's an environmental catastrophe coming, and God gives... Noah the prophet and it's supposedly Noah but it it there are some arguments that the story of Noah comes from the tale of Gilgamesh because there's older tales of the great flood and the, the last great epic ending of history with a massive you know force majeure event of nature and so when you see that you realize that this is a god who's trying to warn the people but they're not going to believe it right you know the, the prophet you know at that time t tries to tell everybody no one believes him right because everyone thinks you know you're crazy you think you're talking to god i mean how many of them do you think would really believe him and obviously it would be very very few and and that's the what ends up happening but the instructions for the ark noah's ark is where tonight we we really start because i mentioned to you on the phone that i had made this massive discovery yes and I'm just about finished the book now that will prove that the true God, the Ancient of Days, who is not the God of War, that later appears in the Old Testament. And it's not clear exactly where that God actually starts in. But it's, it's quite clear to me where it starts in, because wherever there's a God advocating war... That clearly has to be the, whom Jesus calls Yaltabaoth in the Gnostic Gospels, and that the supreme consciousness above Christ, who created Christ, has um, a very, very, very ancient history. And so, what what happens is, you know, when you start to, and I've, I've spent thirty five years doing this, so, and I've done it painstakingly slow, studying each religion on on very, very vast scales in Tibetan Buddhism and Buddhism and Hinduism and in Christianity, ancient Judaism and, and the sor every source that I can get my hands on in tandem with practicing meditation and practicing meditation and eventually having my own direct encounters with Christ 
and my own journeys through seven of the blinding heavens of, of creation and what it's like to actually go through them and, and how it ties into the flying saucers and the different types of flying saucers is really, really astounding because there are three major arcana of flying saucers. You have, you have flying saucers of the warfaring gods and goddesses and you have, you have flying saucers of the demigod goddess realms which are gods and goddesses that live for tens of thousands of years and actually when I was in India in uh, 1996 and I, I was attending the Dalai Lama's conference that he gives there in Dharamsala every spring he was you know we were we he was speaking in the Tibetan language and there were translators and you had these radios with these earpieces in your ears and his his um, lectures were being translated into multiple languages and you had to select your channel for the English language and I was sitting next to this guy named Richard Handley from England who had traveled there and and, um, and uh, Richard Gear was sitting on in his spot you know everybody had their little sections and there was a lot of us there and the Dalai Lama was telling us that literally seriously if you should ever meet a god or goddess from another world and and how you would meet them is not in a vision state but actually meet them which would have to mean they came in some sort of vehicle he was telling us just to beware they appear far greater than us and don't worship them as gods but you know befriend them be kind to them you know do the buddhist thing which is to be peaceful and kind to your neighbor and he spoke about it like it it was an actuality and that's because in tibetan buddhism they have very clear descriptions of the different realms of being and the god goddess realms not unlike the roman and the greek goddess and god realms were were human type beings that had something different in their dna that allowed them to live for tens of thousands of years yeah and in fact i so, I, I, yeah. I, I was just gonna say uh, you know i'm glad you made that point of living for tens of thousands of years because my thoughts are is is who is who is in charge right now who is behind all the evil and deception that goes on on this planet and i know there's many players but it's almost like they've been doing it through time exactly well the first player is actually consciousness i mean see when when you take your dna and your human electrical energy field we are electrical beings who can measure voltage on your fingertips we we have an energy field that extends beyond the body and the energy field and frequency dictates the survival and the health of the organism that you're living in and in fact in the in the um, human genome project when it was about halfway through i was reading this massive book that at this university in texas they had isolated this single gene that caused human aging and they could chemically switch it on and switch it off yeah now that's a devastating proposition because one, with eight billion people on the planet, if we all lived for twenty thousand years, we would have no choice but to reach a space-faring technology so that we could have large exodus of craft leaving the planet Earth and colonizing other planets like Mars. Like you could, you could terraform Mars. You could start growing plants down there and building up the atmosphere and and start with even some simple chlorophyll in the rocks that would slowly spread and then it would spread exponentially and you would have an atmosphere and you could actually breathe down there and the temperatures would change on Mars drastically with an atmosphere as well but see these are things that happen when you when you suddenly realize that you could live forever but imagine if you had to live forever and you had a 20,000 year mortgage <laughs> you would not want to live forever <laughs> with with that one you know hanging over you and that's what they would do to you if you were are stuck on this planet with this particular consciousness of, of slavery and slave economics, which is what we have now. Yeah. But, but what happened first is in our DNA. So when you take in the knowledge of good and evil, what you do is you turn consciousness in from singularity in, in the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is incredibly wealthy where, of statements of singularity and dualism where Jesus warns that when you were in the light you were one but when you come to become two what are you going to do because when you become two you take all that cosmic energy which is in a state of oneness and bliss 
and you go into good and evil and you're now a conflict. So your whole nervous system is nervous. It's a nervous system. And so it, you become neurotic and that conflict eats you alive. It, it destroys everything inside of you and the conflict and creates fear of this supposed character known as the devil, who is the one who symbolically tempts Eve and Adam to take in this forbidden knowledge of good and evil. But this is the way Jesus explained it to me in person, is, is that we are born, all of us were born in the first level in the, of the clear light heaven. But there are multiple levels of heaven, but you're not born in those higher heavens. You're born in a, a very simple, perfect peace and bliss state which is the first clear light heaven or the what's known as the first jhana or samadhi or chrism in different religions. And this is a state of consciousness that meditators strive to attain. And when you attain it, you, you experience rapture and real, real bliss consciousness. Well, what happened from there is, you see, you, you are meant to evolve. You have to go to the higher and higher heavens because ultimately the first level of bliss consciousness doesn't permanently satisfy you. And so it was part of our ascension to fall from grace and go from the singularity state and be tempted by <clears throat> duality. And duality, as soon as you have duality, you have a sphere. Instead of your aura being wide open and plugged into the cosmos and God consciousness, you're now a self egotistical entity that has a force field of positive and negative energy around it. And the positive and negative energy is actually good and evil. But there really is no good and evil. It's only in the mind that it believes it. And because it believes it, it tries to interpret everything as good or bad or right or wrong. See, now and that, the, that yeah. I'm sorry, but that, that's, yeah. that's the tough part. And I've had so many guests who have said that, that very thing. But the tough part is when they, when I'm saying no good and evil, I mean, there's some things that I think everybody on the planet could agree is just plain evil. But I guess it's a matter of perception, you're saying. Well, see, what happens is in order for you to commit an evil act, which is live spelled backwards, which is a life taking event to kill somebody you have to be in a state of conflict first with that opponent. But if you're no longer in a state of conflict, then you can't do the killing. But if that person is in a state of conflict, they can kill you even though you're not in a state of conflict. But see, that's the catch-22. And, and that is, let's say, like in my position, you have children and somebody is coming to kill me. Am I just going to stay peaceful and let them kill me? No. No. I, I'm not, and and but there's a way, and this is kind of what I think um, Star Wars is really all about. In the Force, is is Luke can't give in to the anger of the dark side while he's in battle, and while he's in battle, he's trying to remain singular and plugged into the Force, the the clear light of the undivided mind, and he's he's willing to save his his community of the Jedi and the peaceful, the peaceful people and the peaceful planets. And therefore the, the force supports him to be faster and better in battle, but he's not out looking for a fight. He's not out looking to conquer yet another territory in another territory. He's only there to defend what is good. And so that, that's a true warrior, somebody who can be in singularity and will never use violence unless it is an absolute last resort to save the boundaries of the community or the country. Right. But see, that's the, the, what's really brilliant about Star Wars for me is that it's it's true. We we live we live in a in a world where people have so many religious beliefs, and they believe they're right and the other guy's wrong, and they're willing to either force convert you by sword or weapon, or they're going to. Um, rub up against you and and start a war with you, yeah. and and that's what we've done. And so those the consciousness of violence, as soon as duality becomes not just a playful argument or not a creative debate argument, what it becomes is <clears throat> is very very serious. Then we our consciousness doesn't reach the place where we can develop propulsion systems that can reach the speed of light and beyond. And and it's really brilliant. The creator 
I mean, it's really amazing when you think about like what are the distances between even our own planets. What a hard time we're having, you know, sending humans to Mars. Like this is this is big stuff, let alone another star system. How brilliant does your mind have to be at creative insighting to figure out that technology? You see, the mind won't have the insight if it's stuck in this lower consciousness of duality. So the universe made it that way. If, if you don't reach singularity, you're not going to know how to go to the next level of, of propulsion and flying saucers. And the next level is the gods and the goddesses. And they're the gods and the goddesses, and, and they're, you see them in Hinduism, Buddhism. You actually see them in, in mystic Christianity and many, many hidden gospels like the Gnostic gospels. And they are more concerned with living in paradise and enjoying life in a much a very organic way than they are concerned with wars. But from time to time, the demigods, goddesses, do have to fight wars to defend their territories, but that's not their motive. The, lo the lower consciousness um, civilizations, their, their main focus is military, industrial complexes and war. Sure. Now, what's, in what's interesting is in a galactic model, any galaxy has this model, is the planets that are in the further outmost region are the ones that are governed by war. And the ones in the mid-region, and our Earth and solar system is just on the edge of entering the mid-region, they're the realm of mostly pleasure and gods and goddesses, and, and everyone's living very long lives. And there's not a lot of conflict in their DNA, but there's, there's still a little bit. And so they're going to live for, you know, and the Dalai Lama told us this in India. He told us how long they live, and it's quite stunning. It's in the realm of thirty-five or 40,000 years. So, and then above them, you have the clear light super beings in, you know, the super luminal bodhisattva beings in Buddhism. And you have, you know, like even recently in Bodhidharma magazine, this is only a, a couple of months old uh, um, um, edition. Mm -hmm. There's very clear and rare descriptions of the Buddha. And the Buddha, when, when the disciples came close to him and looked at his hands, there were wheels within wheels spinning inside of his hands. His eyes were blue and his skin was so white that it apparently you couldn't even see a single speck of dust upon it. Like there was something strange about his skin. It, it wasn't normal. And he appears to be Aryan because he has blue eyes, long black eyelashes, and his body is unlike anything anybody's ever seen. And Buddha had the ability to open up with his mind, he could cause his disciples to suddenly see the realm of the gods and the goddesses and their flying vehicles and their where they live. And then he would just close it up after he gave them a lesson. And he would say this to them, that that's not your goal to live with them. Your, your goal is to reach the, the, the illuminated state of being and to meditate and transgress the seven levels of samadhi. And the seventh samadhi, or chrism in Christianity, or what Muhammad attained in Islam was the seventh level of the light, then you're, you're enlightened. You're enlightened. Nirvana begins at the seventh level, and there's even higher levels. There's eighths and the ninths in, in Buddhism, and those beings are super, super powerful. They're amazingly powerful. There's probably no chance of most humans today ever coming anywhere near a being at the level of, of even a Buddha or, a, or you know, let alone some of the other beings out there because they, they get more and more and more powerful. And, and, and these were beings, right? I mean, these were, these were actual flesh and blood type sure. ETs. They're, they're flesh and blood type beings, but they, because of their powers of concentration and meditation, they become light beings. They can dematerialize their physical body like the, the Tibetan Buddhists say that Milarepa and many masters would just leap from mountaintop to mountaintop. It was like they just their body just flew through the air and would go from mountaintop to mountaintop in the Himalayas. They were they were super powerful, and th you know this is the stuff of fiction for us today because we live in a civilization where you know we're interested in machines, we're interested in how to get to Mars and the Moon, but we can't even imagine what it means to vibrate at different frequencies and land on a planet and have not have the temperature of that planet be a, a problem. Like literally, 
there is a there are good documented examples in archives in the Catholic Church of monks walking into burning furnaces with their brown scapular robes on, and their robes don't even burn. Their skin doesn't burn. They're barefoot. They walk into a furnace. And they move a couple of logs around in there, and they spend a long time in there, and they just walk right out. And the temperature didn't do anything to them. So they become, through the power of meditation, like superhuman. So when you imagine, you know, when NASA says, well, you can't live on Mercury, you can't live on on this planet because the temperature is too cold or too hot, you know, that doesn't matter when you understand frequency is temperature. The higher the frequency, the higher the temperature. So if you raise your frequency, your body goes into a high frequency state, and therefore high temperatures are not going to affect you at all. If you if you go into a lower frequency state, then the low temperatures won't bother you at all. So you're basically free to move around. So there could be beings on Venus. I mean, Tesla literally said that he, when he pointed his early radio um, arrays at Venus, he wrote in letters that he was receiving radio messages, what appeared to be intelligent messages from Venus. And NASA says to us now, you know, Venus has sulfuric acid in the sky and there's no way anybody could live there. And so, th- and then again, that's considering that they're exactly the way we are. So then we can actually go, say we did go to Mars. There could be, and some say we're already there, but say we did go to Mars, I mean, there could be beings that are there that are, of such a higher frequency that we would walk right by and not even notice them. It's very possible that Mars, see Mars is the next planet out from the sun. So um, it's uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. So Venus, you know, would be, according to what we think, let's see, as far as temperature goes, it would be in a higher frequency wave state. And therefore, if you went to Venus, the higher frequency beings, you, you, they might be right next to you and you wouldn't see them. And if you go to Mars, things might be a little lower in frequency, you know. But mm-hmm. Mars, you know, I actually calculated, and this is on my website at davidsrated.net. I took the NASA data on the circumference of all the nine planets and I calculated the frequencies that would be similar to the Tesla Schumann frequency for the frequency of Earth. And I counted the frequencies of all the nine planets, and they all correspond perfectly to the five major human brainwave states of consciousness, from D delta to theta to alpha, beta, and gamma. And Mars is alpha. It's upper alpha. And it's a, the alpha state is a very coherent state in the brain. And that's just the frequency at the equator of Mars. And then as you get near the poles of any planet, the frequencies. There's a whole scale of frequencies on each planet. So I mathematically scaled all of the nine planets um, and and did their frequencies. And for example, like one night, this was right when we um, we were flying by Pluto and I decided to do the frequencies of Pluto because I really wanted to see it in consciousness. And I started drifting. I started transmitting the frequencies of Pluto into my consciousness with one of my light stream wands. And I suddenly I saw Pluto, but I was on the back side of it. And it had colors that I can't really describe because they're not colors. They're not tones of the familiar colors that we understand, but they are within the spectrum of the colors we understand. And then I saw an atmosphere around Pluto. And I said, what? How could Pluto have an atmosphere? I said, this is impossible. And I woke up in bed and I said that's impossible within three days NASA the the spacecraft had passed the 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 near side of Pluto and was behind it looking into the sun they they found that it had an atmosphere and and that really convinced me that there's no question in my mind I've been doing this for years that if you pulse your brain and your nervous system with the frequencies of the wavelength of any star or planet then you're going to go there you have the your astral body will go there and you'll get to remote view it and see it and, and what it really looks like. And and you, you don't have to travel with the speed of light. You can travel in consciousness at, at enormous um, speeds way beyond light speed. So I was, in, I was in Pluto in a matter of seconds when I did these frequencies. 
And there's no way that anyone could tell me that I was imagining things because we didn't know Pluto had an atmosphere. NASA had no idea that Pluto would have an atmosphere. And then they, they formally, before they knew it had an atmosphere, they had removed it from the list of the nine planets and said we only have eight planets. But technically, if it has an atmosphere, it's a planet. It's not, a, it's not an asteroid. Then, then would Planet Nine, this uh, new discovery of theirs, well, then would that be the tenth planet? That would be the tenth planet that Sitchin is talking about because the the, the new ninth planet that they're talking about is going to have a very long journey around the sun, which is exactly what Sitchin said. And the thing about the new tenth, or what they call the ninth planet now is that it's throwing asteroids in its uh, gravitational field at an angle away from the angle that the traditional planets move around the sun in. So therefore, it fits the exact description of what Sitchin had said about the 10th planet. So it could be it. And it's also possible that some of these very distant planetoids like Pluto and the 10th planet have an internal heat source thermal heat source that allows beings to live there and survive on radiations from their core and until it gets closer and closer to the sun again but remember temperature is not an issue it's it's definitely not an issue if you really look up the definition of temperature and what causes heat it's the excitation of electrons through the impetus of cosmic radiation from the sun and from from other sources. So if you can have a source of cosmic radiation at your core, including you know radioactive elements, and live in a very distant region from a star, you can have heat. And it's even possible that you know when I was first looking at some of the images coming from Pluto, that there could be um, there could be ETs that are have built bases underneath the ice just like an Eskimo for example can build an igloo and stay warm enough in it in the you know in the Arctic region so yeah so so temperature I mean nature has a way of doing this in fact even I even discovered like I had this experience where I was pulsing my body with frequencies of Pallades and in in that night this little girl appears in my dream and she tells me, this isn't what I really look like. She goes, you, you couldn't really handle what I really look like. But she showed me a couple of vials of these little, they look like Fruit Loop colored lights that were spinning around in this jar of water. And she said, when we did scouting missions to Spica, and I'd never heard of Spica. I, I'm not a very well-educated astronomer that there's a star in Virgo called Spica. Spica. I didn't know that. I mean, I knew classic stars like Sirius and Pleiades, but I didn't know there was even a Spica. And this little girl is telling me this, that when we went to Spica, we discovered super water. And when we started drinking the super water, she told me we gained the ability to quantum leap with our bodies through space time. And we didn't need our ships as much to make very long trips. So they could just physically... Wow. dematerialize and reappear so i woke up that morning and because she told me that basically when they their ships were appearing which they appeared to me in berkeley in 1968 they appeared to billy meyer they said our ships were under attack they went under radar and they said once our craft are in your atmosphere and we materialized they're subject to being destroyed and they don't want to be destroyed so but they do like our planet, and she said we found that we could park our ships very far from the Earth, and they could just quantum leap their bodies in. But they needed this stuff called super water. So first of all, I googled Spica to see if there was a star called Spica, and to my surprise, there's a star in Virgo called Spica. And and second, um, you have to understand that there are certain civilizations of ETs that have reached the status of demigod goddess realms and their ships can move around the the local star neighborhood they can't go from galaxy to galaxy like the super angelic or super luminal beings can but they can go to the different fixed stars and so when they when they were scouting in spike because they found super water so i googled super water and and i found you know you can't find everything on google don't (laughs) rely that the whole Everything that humans know is on Google. A lot of people do that. 
But nevertheless, I found papers on on uh, astronomy university and, and astronomy websites where NASA had detected super water, and some of the super water they detected was near black holes. And when when you understand that the higher the frequency, when you get near X rays and in intense X rays, the temperature is millions of times hotter than ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Millions of times. X-rays are millions of times hotter than ultraviolet rays. But our sun puts out X-class flares from time to time, but most of those X-rays don't really reach us. They, we don't get X-rayed in our bodies because the atmosphere protects us from most of it. We get a very tiny, weak amount of those X-rays coming right down to the Earth. I mean, if we got a lot of them, we would all be mutated. Right. So... So what happens is is NASA is seeing superwater and it's defined as superwater because it's surviving the radiations of these X-ray regions in super high frequency regions of of you know stars and and galaxies. So so there it was superwater. So what happens if you drink the stuff and how do you get it? And so I what I did is I started, you know, we used to distribute a movie called Water, the Great Mystery, and they found researchers from England and Russia and Misaro Emoto found that water responds beautifully to whatever the impetus frequencies are, including consciousness and thought. And therefore, I thought, how can I get super water? How can I make it? And I would get, I would even put um, a glass of water next to my one of my mantra transmitters and pulse it with the palladian frequencies and drink palladian vibrated water and and really it's it's quite amazing like you 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 realize that what's keeping us alive according to science is photosynthesis and photosynthesis transfers light waves and plants in take the light and they build carbon based and biological based life forms and you know plants and then we eat the plants and the animals eat the plants, and some people eat animals. I don't. And they, they. So we're all ingesting everything that that was alive from photosynthesis. We go to sleep at night because we lose the sun. And in regions like Sweden and in the northern hemisphere, you get a lot of depression with a lack of sunlight, and you also get increases of of uh, different types of immune system disorders when you don't get enough ultraviolet light. So we live. On photosynthesis, but I argue that because the sun is pulsing and it has frequencies it's emitting, we're living on photo frequency transmissions because frequencies actually generate geometries and structures, which are the basis and the building blocks of everything on the earth. Like the sun creates the elements on the periodic table, and and not just our sun, but other suns and stars are are generating this stuff all the building blocks on the periodic table and those building blocks on a on a molecular level are all sacred geometries they're all different types of geometries so there you have the main powers what i'm saying is coming from our sun our sun is far greater than anyone can imagine and the freak when we took the frequency recording from nasa of the sound of the sun nasa actually was collecting data signals from a satellite from the signals coming from the sun and they sped it up and they made a recording of it and we pulsed water with the frequencies of the sun and they they did photographs for me in russia before and after with russian tap water and after the sound of the sun and it was a miraculous restructuring of the water really so and when you look at the photograph before and after the sound of the sun, you go, my God, this the water before looked like garbage. Now it looks like the most beautifully restructured water in existence. And that technically is what was happening on Earth before we started introducing electricity, radio stations, microwave towers, cell phones. Over There's over... 10,000 satellites out there transmitting 24/7. So basically we have we have really badly interfered with the uh with the life frequency if you will. Exactly good good answer. We we badly damaged our own organism and therefore I found the only solution is to reintroduce those natural harmonic frequencies 
having a transmitter in your house, which I build and sell on, on my website, and you can transmit the sound of the sun in your house to regenerate your smoothie in your body. You can transmit the frequency of Venus, Earth, Mars, and and the nine planets. And you can also transmit golden ratio frequencies. I mean, we have a whole menu of frequencies you can transmit. And I literally believe we're we're under such attack at the frequency level. And it's from all these sources. And some of the attacks in certain frequencies are intentional. Now, if you look, have you seen um, the new X-Files yet? Have you watched it? I absolutely have. And, David, we've got to take a break here. So I think that's a great yeah. place to, to hold off. And, yeah. and, yeah, we'll talk about that as soon as we get back. So hang on with us. Uh, I most certainly did see the X, new X-Files, and uh, I loved it. And so we'll talk about that when we come back, folks. I am unable to get in the chat room tonight because, well, because that computer is kind of locked up right now. I will, uh, it's the better computer, but uh, I've got to get get in it. I just didn't have enough time uh, tonight to uh, mess around and, and override the password. So, uh, folks, so I won't be in there. But if you want to get in touch with us, okay, I can't get your questions from the chat tonight unless Ira relays any of them to me. But what I can do is open phone lines for you at 803-392-4566. Or you can call. It's totally free. Skype to Skype us. LNM Radio. We'll take calls after the break. Uh, looking forward. I'm really loving this conversation. Um, the whole thing about the frequencies. This is some, this is some real good Good, useful information, folks. So stick around. We'll be back. This is Late Night in the Midlands. I'm Joshua Vera, and I wanted to inform you that Late Night in the Midlands is offering limited on-air advertisement. With 30 and 60 second spots available, or inquire about placing your banner ad on the LNM website, or go ahead and package a deal, but either way, get the attention you deserve and join the LNM family. Contact us at mv at late night in the midlands dot com. Again, that email is mv at late night in the midlands dot com. Share our content and use the hashtag LNM Radio for your chance to win a free subscription. Those who use it at least 10 times a month will find themselves entered into a drawing every month to win a free two-month subscription from Late Night in the Midlands. So spread our news, spread our website, and use hashtag LNM Radio. LNM fans and late-nighters around the world, have you captured something on that photo or video of yours? Send in your photos and videos of ghosts, orbs, UFOs, Planet X, or just about anything content-related by submitting them to the Late Night in the Midlands Facebook group or fan page, or you can submit them on Twitter using hashtag LNM Radio. And if you would rather stay anonymous, then email them to us at mv at latenightinthemidlands.com. Late Night in the Midlands, we're building a bridge to the truth and beyond. Become a late nighter without the late nights and subscribe now to help Late Night in the Midlands bring you the best guests with the best information. Hello, this is Dick Farrell here to tell you about Oxy Silver. 
Legally available only through CureShop.com and HealthyWorldStore.com. Don't be fooled buying silver products from copycats and criminals. So help save lives putting drug lords and criminals out of business and keep the LNM network broadcasting. Register for our free cooperative at HealthWorldAffiliates.com forward slash 4948. That's HealthyWorldAffiliates.com forward slash 4948. And buy OxySilver and other great products in package specials at great discounts from the CureShop.com. Buy OxySilver. GI Flora Pro, Green Harvest, Zeolove, and Love Minerals at great discounts at CureShop.com. That's CureShop.com with two Ps. C-U-R-E-S-H-O-P-P-E.com. Or call toll-free at 1-888-621-7611. That's 1-888-621-7611. Do it now. Are you a late-nighter? Well, if not, here is one more reason to join the family. We have added the Late Nighters Forum to LateNightInTheMidlands.com and it is open for discussion of our many topics and guests. Now you have a place where you can share your thoughts and ideas with the entire Late Nighter community. So become a Late Nighter by subscribing on our website, latenightinthemidlands.com, and start leaving your mark on the Late Nighter community now. The LNM Radio Network offers a moderated chat room at www.latenightinthemidlands.com. Just click the chat and listen page from the drop-down menu at the top of any page on the website, or click the Listen Live button at the top of the homepage at www.latenightinthemidlands.com. Attention LNM Radio Network listeners, did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the LNM Radio Network by calling 605-562-4203? No smartphone app or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 605 562 4203 to listen to the LNM radio network on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Is there proof of God's existence in our government's records? Author Jose Calazo brings his years of research into this stunning question to light with his new book. Discover how new and experimental technologies may change our world forever and uncover monumental proof and answers to mankind's greatest questions in God does exist. No more nuclear testing and more. You could find Jose Colazo's book, America's New Slavery, on Amazon.com. Imagine, if you will, a man, a media, speaking the truth. Imagine a show that covers UFOs, ET races, the paranormal, and the not-so-normal. A media that speaks the truth no matter who or what it leads to. Imagine, if you will, a media that covers everything. (laughs) Folks, you just entered the LNM zone. LNM, keeping it real when others don't. On the east coast of the United States, from the capital city, Columbia, South Carolina. You're listening to Late Night in the Midlands with your host, Michael Vera. To talk to Michael Vera, dial 803-392-4566 or around the world on Skype. Just use Skype ID LNM Radio. All right, folks, we are back, and I promise you uh, we are not laughing at all um, because this really isn't a laughing matter. It's more of a... a matter of life and death when you think about it. I mean, the big picture, uh, it really is. I mean, you've got to understand who you are, what you are, where you've come from, where your history's come from, and where it's all heading. And so we'll talk about some of that tonight, uh, folks. And uh, if you're losing your religion, that doesn't mean you've lost your uh, spirituality, and you know, to keep this spirit, this L&M spirit going, what we do is we ask for you to become a late-nighter so that you can have late nights without the late nights. It's that simple. You keep us on the air, and we continue to uh, help you realize, I don't know, uh, expanding your mind and certainly getting to the truth because that's what it, that's the most important thing 
uh, when it all comes down to push and shove is getting to the truth. And that's what we try to do here every single night on Late Night in the Midlands. And we're doing it tonight with David Serrata. And, uh, you know, he's it's been a while since he's been on the show, um, but he has been on uh, quite a few times, I think, in the past. And so um, really interesting stuff. If you want to get in on the conversation, how you'll do it is 803-392-4566. Of course, you could call on Skype. L&M Radio is our uh, caller ID or our Skype ID, I should say. And so you could get us that way. And I do ask that when you call in, keep yourself muted or whatever it is, quiet on your end, nevertheless. Because if I hear you before I call you on, then I'm going to have to get rid of you. So, um, but anyhow, and and again, I can't take your questions in the chat because I'm not in there tonight. So let's get back to it. David is linked up on our homepage on latenightinthemidlands.com. Right in the picture slider. He's also linked up on our schedule page, the Late Night in the Midlands schedule page. There's three, I think, three different links there. A couple are Vimeo and, of course, to his website. You can go check those out. Uh, David, we are back, and uh, we left off. You asked me if I had seen the X-Files, and, oh, yes, I absolutely have. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> I I saw them online on the Fox website, and, you know, one day... I'm in LA and I get out of my yoga class at the Steve Ross yoga class and there's Chris Carter and David Duchovny sitting there and I said, wait, I got to get you a copy of my Evidence the Case for NASA UFOs DVD and I ran to the car and got one and I handed it to David Duchovny and he says to me, you know, I don't really believe in any of this stuff. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and I didn't know that was Chris Carter sitting next to him. But actually, my my brother Tim was married um, to Kathy Gilroy, and, and her mom is producing this uh, new series. And Kathy Gilroy worked with Chris Carter on Millennium. So there was there were a lot of connections to him, and it's amazing that he's, he's never really tuned into my work. But I'll tell you a fun X-Files story. My friend Michael Mann, who's a location manager in Los Angeles, he was given the job to scout the location for the very first episode. And I went with him on the location scout in the San Bernardino Mountains. We came to this town and we go into this cafe and we tell them what we're doing. And the people in the cafe said there was a huge UFO sighting here. Everybody saw it. The farmers saw it. And it was this big craft that came down in the valley. And Michael Mann had loaned his entire UFO library to Chris Carter and Chris Carter wouldn't give it back to him. When they moved the whole show to Vancouver and Michael Mann was no longer the location manager, he wanted his library back. And Chris Carter didn't know anything. He took a crash course in ufology and was reading everything he could get his hands on. And finally, Chris Carter gets a call from MGM because Michael Mann's dad was Daniel Mann, who directed Elizabeth Taylor in Battlefield 8. And he gets this call from the, the studio that this is Daniel Mann's son. you got to give you got to give all his books back, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a funny little story and how it all began. I mean, that's literally the very beginning. And um, and my brother Tim works in the film business in Vancouver as a as a uh, production manager and first AD, and he's worked on a lot of these shows. And so it's the actors don't necessarily resonate with what it is. I actually think Dana Scully, who's the skeptic, is the one in real life who who resonates more with the material. But there's no doubt that Chris does. I mean, look what he's saying. I mean, first thing, the first thing you have to understand is that, you see, our, I know this because I sat down with Glenn Seaborg, who chaired the Atomic Energy Commission under Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. And, and Seaborg was working in the Advanced Physics Corporation in Irvine, California, and I worked there with Bogdan Magwitch helping him try to get his big nuclear fusion, non-radioactive nuclear fusion project, into the next stage of development. That was $25 million spent on this fusion reactor. And there was Seaborg. I mean, Seaborg headed the AEC, authorized nuclear testing, won the Nobel Prize with Macmillan for the discovery of plutonium that led to the bombs. And there is Seaborg sitting right next to me several days, and I, I really got to know some big, deep, dark secrets. 
But one day I was sitting with him in the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab up at Berkeley with his assistant, Albert Giorso, and I told him about my UFO sighting right there. Then I said, this lab would have had a perfect view of the UFO in 1968 that I saw because everybody on the street was going crazy over it. And he he was really kind, and he said, you know, we're not working on anything like that yet. With 37 levels above top secret, Seaborg had, I was told by his assistant, but he said that's very interesting because he said if you can build a gravity generator, you don't need to do nuclear fusion because you would have a power source way beyond, way beyond fusion. Well, only a, only a, you know a decade later after that meeting, I was lecturing at a U, Bob Brown's last UFO conference in Nevada, and a gentleman comes up to me and he said, "I work at the space lab at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab Space Lab right on the hill." And I said, "Yeah, I know the space lab. I, I've been up there." And I've sat there and had lunch with Seaborg and picked his brain when he was an old timer. And Seaborg is gone now. And he said, we all saw a UFO right outside the window in 1972. And, and it wasn't ours. And so they, they regularly, the, the, the craft were regularly coming to Berkeley. For some reason, there has to be a portal there. And there are labs doing research that, on things that we don't really understand. And one of the areas of research that Seaborg got into that was really dark, and this ties into X-Files, is at Vanderbilt University, they were injecting pregnant women with radioactive isotopes to mutate their offspring to see if the mutations could produce a new type of human being. And a lot of the mutations, of course, were severe and adverse in kids with giant heads and all kinds of problems, as they showed in the X-Files in the episode two. And they use frequencies also to manipulate DNA, because it's a known fact that if you take fruit fry larvae and you expose it to cosmic radiation or X-rays or, or even <clears throat> gamma rays from <clears throat> nuclear sources, the fruit fry will mutate and produce phenotype, which are physical changes in the next offspring. In fact, in Russia, they did this with fish, and they would they would produce a new fish that had rainbow stripes on their bellies, and the previous generation didn't have any rainbow stripes on their bellies. Well, David, I, you know, just for the record, I think that's what they're doing now with these genetically modified mosquitoes. Because one of the things it's doing is it's really affecting pregnant women and it's causing a underdeveloped brain in the babies and almost an enlarged head. It's kind of strange to me. Right. Well, well, that's it. They're doing this intentionally. And that's what the X-Files was showing. And a lot of the media got furious and said, well, the government, where's Chris Carter getting this stuff from? The government isn't that evil. And I'm telling you, I knew Seaborg. When I exposed him in a small magazine article that he was injecting pregnant women with radioactive isotopes at Vanderbilt University, he wanted to kill me. He <laughs> wanted to know where I was. And and he knew it was true because I found the documentation, which you cannot find on the Internet today. You can find a few fragments of Seaborg and the, the experiments at Vanderbilt University, but I know. you don't know the half of it. I, I've tried. Believe me, I was looking like crazy, and I'm like, boy, they're really covering their tracks here. They're really covering their tracks, especially on protecting his name because he's, he's a Nobel Prize winner. So what they did with these kids and how far they went with it, you know, is, is quite astounding. But see, we do know, and that's why what I've done, and this is my new huge discovery, is, you know, years ago I had mapped all the electromagnetic frequencies of the Great Pyramid, and that's... That's with a new theory, not the acoustic frequencies, not with the resonant frequencies in the acoustics, but the electromagnetic frequencies that the stones would give off. And the way you do that is, see, when you build a pyramid with three different types of stone, it's the same way you build a transistor or a crystal oscillator. You use layers of different materials to get electrons to start moving in the material. And the pyramid is built with three different layers. It has a very radioactive granite core, which causes ionizing radiation. And Robert Temple actually took Geiger counters in the pyramid in many of the, of the sites in Egypt and found the radiation levels to be quite high. And he was actually stunned on his Geiger counter how high the readings were. So that means you have ionizing radiation, which is a, a form of energy that causes oscillations of the electrons in the material and so the electrons 
get excited in the material due to heat, electrical charge, and and also there might have been a device in the Grand Gallery, I believe, in the pyramid to generate and the charge that would excite the electrons even further and make the pyramid a super oscillator. So what you do is you take the speed of light divided by the wavelength, and I took the capstone base and divided the speed of light in Egyptian inches, which is almost the same as our inch. There's barely any difference. The The speed of light in inches divided by the, the per square wave perimeter of the capstone, and I got 5.151 megahertz square. And the slope angle is 5515, when it's 51 degrees and 51 minutes. And that built a case that the builder knew the speed of light, knew that it was a crystal oscillator, cut the pyramid, um, t capstone off at the exact point where that frequency would be the last frequency on the slope tuner. And therefore, the, whoever built the pyramid knew the speed of light, and we didn't know the speed of light until 1972. So I decided to calculate all the frequencies up and down the slope tuner of the Great Pyramid, and it produced, you'll see in the video links on your website, if you go to the Law Scale video and the Vortex video, you'll see the 5151 harmonics, um, and you'll understand how we have discovered a superior tonal frequency scale in the paraben math. Now, that's a discovery I've already lectured about for a few years now, but what I've done now is I have calculated the frequencies based on the dimensions of everything God told the prophets to build, from Noah's Ark to the Holy of Holies, which is the, the cube inside of Solomon's temple where the Ark of the Covenant was stored. The Ark of the Covenant itself and all the way down the list to Solomon's, I mean, uh, I mean, actually a lot of people don't know this, but the prophet Ezekiel, who saw the giant wheels, the giant craft, was given instructions from an angel of God to build a temple. And that temple was never built. But the resonant frequencies in all of these structures are the same numbers in the scale that I found in the Great Pyramid. And they're the same frequency numbers in these tones. And we know that, that in the Gospel of the Egyptians, Jesus taught his disciples to use their voices with vowels to do these ascending tones that were obviously from Egypt. And that the ancient Egyptian priests, we know, did toning as a means of turning on their light body, activating their DNA in their light body to become ascended light beings themselves. And so it's the first evidence we have that Christ ever actually taught an actual technique where you would actually do this technique and you would go into higher states of consciousness. So the fact that the Holy of Holies produces the same tones and the same number, you take... You take the square, now you, this is a very exact measurement. There's no way to do what I'm telling you to do unless you know what a true cubit is, a true royal cubit length is. And a true royal cubit can range from 20.6 inches up to a few, even a few inches beyond that. And that's because the ancient Egyptians didn't know what a true cubit was themselves. And the secret lies in the Great Pyramid itself there is a measurement in there that appears in over 14 places that it gives us the exact definition of a true cubit. And a true cubit is 20.605 inches and not 20.6. And that little bit of difference may, may, changes everything. Like, for example, you take... Now, the Ark of the Covenant was inside of the Holy of Holies, which was inside of Solomon's temple. And God told the prophets to build... Solomon's Temple and the Holies, Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies is 20 by 20 by 20 royal cubits. And a lot of people don't know it's royal cubits. They think it's a regular cubit. And a regular cubit is for a common human builder based on the elbow to the tip of the finger. But a royal cubit is so long that at 20.605 inches, that, that there's an actual ratio, Mike, to the, mm. to the height of a person based on the elbow to the fingertip. And I, and I looked at a study that was done, and then I took my own, because I'm six feet tall, which is a, a moderate height. It's not a tall man, but it's a moderately tall man. Com compared to nowadays, these kids come out, they're like 
Beanstalks. <laughs> Giants. I mean, I feel like a shrimp standing next to some of these kids. Oh, I, mean, I, don't I don't know what they're eating. <laughs> but anyway, the ratio in this study was consistent with what I measured myself at. But a royal cubit of 20.605 from the elbow to the finger would produce a human at least as tall as Shaquille O'Neal, seven feet. So that would mean the the builders of the Great Pyramid and the Royal Cubit system going all the way back into God's first design, which is Noah's Ark. The first design we know of is Noah's Ark. It's the mm-hmm. first one we know of. Although I'm going to argue in my new discovery in a new book that is coming out, I can prove that the Great Pyramid was designed by the Ancient of Days, the God of the the God of the first prophet Enoch. And and many prophets after that until things got very confusing and there were many different gods involved and many of the writers and the historians were archiving the wrong god of you, war and mix, mixing it in with the true god. Do you think that's why we might uh, see pictures that, that arise with uh, what looks to be like pyramids on Mars or even the moon? Right, because you see, once you once you understand... like. It's, this is kind of jumping a bit, but once you understand that once beings cross the seventh level of enlightenment, like Muhammad did, the prophet in Islam, they're so powerful. According to the Buddha, once you do that, you're a no-returner. You you can't come back in another life and interact with humans because you're so powerful, you might damage them. Now, remember, Moses was told by God to put markers on the mountain because if the people crossed the markers, they would die. Not that God would kill them, but the cosmic radiations coming from this superluminal being would destroy them. Now, this will sound crazy to your audience, but I personally had first had blinding visions of Christ in Topanga, California in 1994. And but then one day, and I was living in a yurt on my dad's ranch. He had horses with his wife on three acres in Topanga Canyon, Right uh, next to the uh, the inn of the the seven, it's called the inn of the seven rays, I think, in Topanga, the the restaurant there, and the there's a little spiritual bookstore there, and that was like down the hill from where my yurt was pitched, and Christ would only appear to me in my tent, which is quite interesting. But nevertheless, one day I'm awake, and he appears right in front of me. And he is, he did not look like the pictures. This was a man with a neck that was so thick and muscles in his arms and chest that was this was a man who built stuff, who was an architect's son. This was no wispy hippie. This guy was powerful. And he his hair was was reddish brown and it, he had a lot of sun damage on his skin from the many um many, many days and months that he would fast in the desert in the hot sun. So I wouldn't say that that by looking at him he looked pretty. He he was he was weather beaten by the elements, but he was so powerful that within three seconds the radiations coming off him were burning my nerves. I couldn't take it, and in three seconds he disappeared and he showed me. Now remember, when Christ resurrected, he burned his image into the shroud of Turin, the cloth, the burial cloth. And that's because the radiations coming off of his new body are so powerful that nobody could be near him in that state. And in, in the Pistis Sophia, which is a collection of, of, of appearances of Christ over 11 years after the resurrection to his disciples, he would blind them when he appeared. They would just have to cover their eyes and fall on the ground because the power and the radiations coming from him were enormous. Well, one time, I literally went to Saudi Arabia two days before the Twin Towers came down. And I'm in Saudi Arabia, and I went there because I was a defense contractor in Irvine, California, building landmine and bomb detection systems for airport security with a whole new system, way better than x-rays. And our defense contract ran out, and I was sent there, and I met the royal family there. I met princes and members of the family I was picked up by second to the king at the airport, second assistant to the king. He whisked me through security. And I had meetings in palaces. And with by literally the next day, the towers were coming down, and the houseboy woke me up and said, Mr. David, you must watch CNN. And I said, no, Mr. David must sleep. 
He said, no, Mr. David, you must watch CNN. And I'm watching it, and I'm saying, this is a Godzilla movie. This isn't really happening. This is just some fantasy somebody's having in Saudi Arabia. And so it, they actually showed on the news in Saudi Arabia three of the alleged hijackers with their passports. They were alive, and one guy was playing the guitar really peacefully in the living room with his family, and he's supposed to be dead, and he's supposed to be on one of those airplanes. So there you go. And there I am, and I can't leave the house because Americans and I was Canadian. My passport is Canadian are in danger. In fact, two Canadians were killed in Iraq right after because the Middle East thought they were going to be nuked within days and they may as well just kill any American or Canadian European they could get their hands on. And very, very quickly, they were assured that that wouldn't happen for some unknown reason because that would be the logical thing to do if we were truly being attacked by them. And and you know that there's something wrong there. But nevertheless, I was locked in this room for days, and I had to get a flight out to London. And I didn't want to be there anymore. And I didn't want to fulfill my mission of trying to find money for airport security, because look what just happened. <laughs> so um, one day, the Prophet of Islam appears to me about 10 feet away from me. And... I, I've ne nobody has any pictures of him. Nobody knows what he looks like. But he's so powerful. The radiation's coming from him. The same thing happened. My my nerves started to burn, and I had to look down. And th th it was it's unimaginable how holy and powerful the vibrations are coming off of the prophet. And so, <clears throat> what I'm telling you is, it's exactly like the Buddha said: when you cross that level of enlightenment, you're so powerful. That it's literally, and you can see depictions of this in the ancient Greek. You can see depictions of this in the ancient Sumerian tablets, where gods become and goddesses so powerful and radiant that you have to be an adept to be anywhere near them because of the rays coming off of them. So this is consistent in in the case of Moses with the markers. Don't tell the people not to cross the markers, and so when a person reaches the status of a super enlightened being they become like a god and throughout history we tend to put them those individuals on the highest highest pedestals and in fact there's a great case robert thurman who was uma thurman's dad the actress uma thurman's dad and is a professor of buddhism he cites this case where the buddha meets the hindu god brahma and for for many hindus brahma is god he's the god of the universe and buddha meets brahma and and says, are you really the God of the whole universe? And he said, no, no, no. People think I'm God, but, but you know, I'm powerful but because I didn't create this whole universe. And it's kind of a funny little interview with Buddha and Brahma because just to get anywhere near Brahma, you have to be in this super high frequency state yourself and you find out the truth that I'm sorry, I'm not really the God of the whole universe. I'm just a super powerful being. And that's what... See, that's what's very different. When we egoify a god and we say, this, there's only one god and there can only be one god and all the other gods, you know, we're going to squish you <laughs> until you find out that they're all friends and they're all super powerful luminal beings that live in the light and they live in peace and there's no war in their realms. And it's only us with our little egos who put our gods on pedestals. Like, see, Muhammad said in Surah 42 of the Quran that you don't make war and don't divide the religion with the Christians and the Jews. Well, yet, well you know, in, they, in, in the Bible itself, it's, you know, that the, the God uh, depicted there says, you know, you better not worship anybody but me. Um, and, well, see, that is what Yalta Bea said in, in the Gnostic Christian Gospels. It says he's a jealous and an angry God. Well, a God who suffers from jealousy and anger and wants to control everybody, that's, that's a demigod. That's how they are. They they battle among themselves to get to the top of the hill. And see, that's where the Bible got really distorted. And that's why Jesus, um, and this is just before the verse where he says, before Abraham was, I am. Just before that, you'll see him debating with a group of Jews that you're, you're worshiping the wrong God. You're, he's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. That's what Jesus says. So... We know that Jesus knows that there was a discrepancy and that there was a point where people started worshiping the wrong one. And then there were people worshiping the right God. But when the Bible was made and written, they mixed the two together at a certain point, And you think it's the same being, but it isn't. 
and and that's that makes clar- sense. It does. Yeah, and that's clarified in the Gnostic, the Gnostic Gospels. It's very clear that Yalta Baoth is the king of the demigods. He's a warfaring god, so he's a god of war, like Zeus, and he possesses great, powerful weapons like Zeus or Indra. In the Hindu system, Indra is just like Zeus. He's the thunderbolt. He's he's got a weapon that is unbeatable, and so you know. And, the, and when I when I think about uh, they they talk about uh, Satan and uh, you know Lucifer in the uh, Garden of Eve, you know, uh, given information, tell you know that he shouldn't have what you know. It almost seems like it's like in the environment we're in now here, like in the United States, for instance. Uh, you know, you tell the people the truth and right away you become a villain and I, I sometimes I've looked at it almost like those kinds of stories you know well exactly I mean look at what the X-Files is doing right now in these episodes they're they're spilling the beans on something so deep it, it's so incredibly deep that that they were mutating humans to try to create a superhuman that's what they were doing with yeah. the radiation experiments and now we know that if you, for example, our current music scale in in my tone test, ascending tone test, you take a signal generator, you enter the frequencies of the 12 tones of the chromatic scale or the seven bass tones, and you scale up and you don't turn each tone off, you leave them on, and you'll hear the distortion, how distorted our music scale is. And in fact, I even tested <clears throat> the solfeggio scale it's not actually a music scale. It's only nine tones. It's much better, but it distorts at the fourth tone and up. The scale I found in the Great Pyramid is the most superior, beautiful, perfect harmonic scale. And even the 432 scale, which is very popular all over the Internet, um, distorted worse than our modern music scale. It's actually worse. Really? <laughs> and, the, and the 444 scale distorted even worse than that. What, what, so, what, what's your opinion on 528? Well, see, 528 is part of solfeggio, and solfeggio tones as a, they're not a complete scale because you don't have octaves. Um, okay. <clears throat> they're very good. Solfeggio tones are very good. There's just a tiny bit of distortion in there on the fourth note up, and that that means that whoever knew the true solfeggio, obviously this is the theory, is that we're all listening to music that's slightly, slightly out of tune, and therefore it won't allow us to fully activate our chakras. It's activating them a little bit, which is why you feel emotions when you listen to music, but it's not taking us all the way. The tones I found, which are in the Holy of Holies, they're in the Ark of the Covenant, they're in the Great Pyramid, I found them everywhere. They're in all of God's designs, the true God's designs, and I don't believe Noah's Ark was a boat. I never did as a kid. I said, how are you going to fit every animal on earth in pairs uh, on a boat I am for with 40 you. days? I am with you on that one. Go ahead. <laughs> and they're going to they're going to have to go to the bathroom. And what are you going to do? Like every one of them. And there's <laughs> even a new uh, researcher that actually made all the big news channels all over the world who proved that Noah's Ark is a circle. But a circle begs to present itself as a portal and i believe it's a frequency portal like a great pyramid is a is actually a generator of frequencies that opens up a portal and the the animals were all moved in pairs through the portal of noah's ark see now i and thought that, it might have been just I, i'm sorry I, I thought it might have been dna and and you don't know, have something to do with uh space travel but but yeah but see it could do that it could do that too mike it could be it could be when you go through a portal, you're stripped down into a high frequency state, ah. and there's only nothing left but the vibration of the hologram of that animal, and then it can be re-imprinted into water and turned into a cell, and, and it can be animated back into life. Kind of like but, a 3D printer. Like a 3D, and look at that. Like, look at the idea of where 3D printing is going. Where it's going is we're going to be able to 3D print everything, including your house, by with large 3D printers. And we're going to get to the point where the banks are going to have to say, look, if this is what I believe. I believe for any civilization to reach space, 
you have to get everyone out of slavery, out of their mortgages and their rents and working, you know, six, you know, five, six days a week just to pay for that and free their minds so they can focus on a level of creativity to have the insight to develop interstellar travel. And I think any civilization that reached interstellar travel had to, the rulers had to free their people up so their minds were relaxed and not stressed out because we can't do it with all the best minds in the best universities. And it's not like universities ever really invented that many things. It was more a free enterprise where automobiles and computers and things were invented. But nevertheless, the the universities produce a lot of good minds. But nobody can figure out what gravity is. Nobody at the university level is figuring out anti-gravity. But the X-Files is saying something very powerful in the first episode and that these zero-point energy devices have been working for an awful long time. We were, We've already made our presence on Mars and moons in the solar system and there's a group of us that hold themselves way above the rest and they keep the rest of us in such slavery and to a level of mind manipulation like I had a guy who worked for a satellite company in Seattle buy one of my transmitters because he said that this company knows a very specific gigahertz frequency that destroys human DNA. And he said they're using it in the internet. They're using it everywhere. And his nerves were erect because he I works agree. for them. And he wanted one of my devices to reharmonize his nervous system. And I'm like, what do you mean? I said, what's the frequency? And he told me the frequency. And I think it's something like 7.8 gigahertz. It's it's somewhere in that range, and he said this is a this is a very specific number, and they're using it on the population. So th- this is literally what you know in the the second episode of X Files you see Mulder introduce infrasound, and infrasound are low frequencies that you don't hear that can activate a tone inside of the brain that can really disrupt you and disorient you and you know what david when i seen that it made me think i'd never been as intense as what he was showing on that but but i've heard that i've heard that that pitch in my head before and you know i and when i have heard it i've turned things off around me make sure tv's off computers off and it goes away if it goes away then that's definitely an intentional broadcast and I think they're they're broadcasting frequencies to make people get you know you can break down the artery walls you can if somebody's close to having you know a heart attack they can induce it easily you can just heat up their their nervous system and if you heat it up enough then it's just gonna it's gonna overload the system and and the weakest part of the system is gonna collapse. And isn't it strange, like all these musicians, now Joe Cocker dies at 70, Bowie, I mean, um, Glenn Fry. I mean, is there something going on? Is it coincidence that these guys all did a lot of drugs and booze and they're just all dying young? I mean, are they all just dying because somebody's using a frequency weapon on them because they didn't like Bowie's new album, Dark Star, and they didn't like what he was trying to say in the new album? It's very mysterious how they're all just dropping off. Yeah, and, and there is something to it. I, I, like I said, I mean, there was a couple weeks ago where I heard that ringing. And that's why when I seen it on X-Files, I said, oh, my God. I mean, it's, that's it. But it wasn't that intense. But it was, you know, it was annoying, to say the least. And, and I actually started getting some, you know, pains around in my chest. I didn't like it. I turned everything off, and it did go away. So I believe that they are doing these frequencies, and that's why I, I refuse to use Wi-Fi or any of that. And I have an old TV that sits here. I I won't switch to one of those new digital deals because I feel like that was intentional too. They wanted to make it easier to blast their frequencies. Well, that, that, yeah, as long as they have a transmitter, they can induce frequencies and believe it or not even light bulbs i've actually done tests on them where if you plug a light bulb into a a signal generator and put a frequency through it the light bulb will transmit the frequencies into your house so they have a way of getting frequencies at you 
I mean, there's myriads of ways for them to bombard you. In fact, they can even just use a satellite and send a beam at your house if, if they want to. But that's, see, that's what's, what's happening is the only way out of this trap. Like, here's another example. This is in Claude Swanson's book, The Synchronized Universe. And Claude has a PhD at MIT. He worked with the same fusion scientists I did, Bogdan Castle Magwitch at MIT on the on the Helium-3 fusion project. And I met Claude Swanson many times. He's a brilliant guy. And his book is incredible, The Synchronized Universe. I mean, he's he's using physics to explain levitating saints and saints walking into burning furnaces. And he he has this one section of the book that really disturbs me. And that's where Robert Monroe from the Monroe Institute, the very famous out-of-body master who, who worked with many people in the military. And Monroe is, is put in a his sleeping area, this cage. They make a cage around his sleeping area with wires. And they don't put any electricity in the wires. And he describes going out of body and going through the wires in his astral body and going out. But then when they put certain frequencies in the wires, he was trapped. He could not get out. And, and that is an experiment that is so deadly because I literally believe what's happening right now on the earth, and I don't know how many of you are experiencing this, but even with all my years of meditation, like I can go into deep states of bliss almost every night, real high frequency states of ecstasy meditating, but then I'll go to sleep and have dreams that don't make any sense at all. And when I was a kid and younger, and even in the 70s and 80s, I would have astounding experiences behind sleep. It wasn't until I developed my mantra transmitters and my wands and I could pulse great pyramid frequencies into my room that I could suddenly access the higher astral plane and have really, really amazing visions and meet with the Palladians, you know, using frequencies of Pleiades and using Syrian frequencies and meeting with Syrian beings. But without my ability to, to control my environment and put my own frequencies into my own sleeping environment, could I change that? I couldn't change it with all of my own effort. And, and that was the same case with Robert Monroe. He was a master at leaving his body at will. He could not do it with these certain frequencies being transmitted into his sleeping area. So, so I believe what's happened to the planet is they know this. Now, this is really scary X-Files stuff. They know, in the Human Genome Project, They remember I said this earlier in the, in the interview, that they can identify the gene that causes aging, and it, you can switch it on and off, and yeah. you can make a person basically live for many hundreds of years. And they know this they, the, when they map the human genome, and this became classified research. So that means that if the universe decides to activate your DNA by sending in cosmic rays. Now look at this news on spaceweather.com. Only a few days ago, there's a, there's a graphic showing that cosmic rays are intensifying between March 2015 and January 2016. There's a graph showing a steady increase in cosmic rays. And if cosmic rays are increasing, your DNA is receiving it. And we know this from fruit fly larvae studies, that if you if you change the frequencies that you're putting into the DNA, you'll see phenotype real physical changes in the offspring. So is the universe trying to to change our DNA and therefore what they want to do, they don't want us to awaken and be illuminated. They want us to be subservient, dumbed down slaves who were, will pay their mortgages and work six days a week and even seven days a week to pay for the darn thing and your food just to stay alive. And while they're rich and they have all the money and they have the alternative space program, you're working your butt off to pay for whatever they're doing. So that's God in the universe saying, I'm going to change the frequency of the humans and make them more awake. But all they have to do is do wide span DNA studies and if certain genes are switching on, they know every gene in the human body now. They know what its purpose is, most of it. And so therefore they can go, we don't like where it's going. We're going to force vaccinate all the children and make it look like we're vaccinating them for a supposed virus. That's right. And meanwhile, we're just going to 
turn all those genes off that the universe is trying to turn on right now. Damn, David, you are whistling my tune tonight. You really are. But go, go ahead. Uh, we we got a break coming up in about oh two minutes, and uh, but but uh, go ahead and finish up on that note, and uh, we'll take that break, and we'll come back and continue. Uh, we've got uh, uh, our last segment coming up here. Yeah. So I literally have seen like you know since i started this online meditation course called quantum regenesis where i teach people how to do breathing exercises how to use your own voice to the pitches you hear in the in the tones of the scale we have a total of 360 tones we have 120 tones amongst 12 octaves of 10 tones each and they're all harmonic none of them distort i can move up and down anywhere i want on my pyramid scale and my holy of holy scale, all of the all of the sacred sites in and that were God designed have these frequencies built into it. They're all perfectly harmonic, whereas our music scale is not. And uh, I have a new video coming up. I, I just haven't finished it yet on my YouTube channel, Spaceman ninety nine, which you can look for in the next few days. But where I really demonstrate the distortion in the four thirty two, the four forty four scale, the chromatic scale. Slight distortion in the solfeggio scale. The solfeggio scale is very good. It's it's better than our chromatic um, music scale, but it's frequencies that determine what your DNA is 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 going to turn on or turn off, and how you're going to switch on your chakras, your energy centers, to activate your true light body. Jesus said a devastating thing in the Gospel of Philip. He said. If you don't attain the resurrection, the light body, when you live, when you die, you'll receive nothing. The church made it look like they had the authority to save your soul for him. And that's how they tricked us, is they didn't really want us to get our light bodies turned on, which was called the chrism. The chrism mm-hmm. is is the light body being turned on. And they thought, Jesus says in, in the Gospel of Philip, that the, by the baptism alone, they are not saved. You have to get the chrism, which is the light body. And the way you get the light body is what Jesus taught in the Gospel of the Egyptians is the right tones at the right pitch and using your voice. When, when you use your voice with these tones, it produces the most beautiful sounds you've ever heard. It's so beautiful to hear your own voice blending in with these tones. And, and this is the secret, the only way to get out of the frequency war because what the X-Files is showing you is that there's a frequency war. It's called infrasound. They can put frequencies that you can't hear that cause your nervous system to produce very disturbing sounds like you mentioned, and then you turn everything off and it stops. And they're doing this as a science to keep us down, to, to keep us shopping at Walmart and put in go, and working, driving our cars and never stopping so that we can never stop to think. But their mistake is, as rulers is that they want us to reach true, true space-faring technology and, and, and become a space-faring civilization, is they need to free our minds, unless they've already done it. Now, if they've already done it, and, and we, we heard ben Rich, ben Rich at Lockheed Martin Skunk's work say that anything you can imagine we already know how to do, then that means there's a breakaway civilization. They look at themselves as superior to us, and they just keep us as slaves down here while they're out exploring the universe oh yeah absolutely david hang on right there we're gonna take this break and then we'll come back and you and i will finish up uh wow i mean he is really really whistling my tune tonight folks i mean i can't disagree with anything he's saying here i mean wow frequencies i mean maybe even like i've said years ago maybe they're using things like harp and Maybe they're using it as like a frequency jail. Maybe they're trying to even keep our souls uh, trapped here in their 3D reality. I don't know. Folks, David Serrata is my guest tonight. This is Late Night in the Midlands. I'm Michael Vera. He is linked up on our homepage at latenightinthemidlands.com and on our schedule page. You're welcome to call in after this break. The number's on our website. You can call in using Skype also. Uh, Don't go anywhere, folks. It's really, really interesting tonight. Hello. 
this is Dick Farrell here to tell you about OxySilver. Legally available only through CureShop.com and HealthyWorldStore.com. Don't be fooled buying silver products from copycats and criminals. Read Dr. Horowitz's book, Healing Celebrations, to learn how miracle healings can be made to happen through faith, prayer, and a pure diet. Get great immunity using vitamin C, D, and OxySilver, Liquid Dentist, GI Flora Pro, a top-shelf probiotic. Use Green Harvest as a great-tasting meal substitute for energizing organic nutrients and losing weight. And Zeola, a natural clays for detoxifying your body. More advice, all these products, and more are available from thecureshop.com. Register for our free cooperative at healthworldaffiliates.com forward slash 4948. That's healthyworldaffiliates.com forward slash 4948. And buy OxySilver and other great products in package specials at great discounts from thecureshop.com. That's cureshop.com with two Ps. C-U-R-E-S-H-O-P-P-E dot com. Or call toll free at one 888 7611. That's 1 888 621 7611. Do it now. Hey, folks. Do you love late night in the Midlands? Do you miss shows because of the time of night? Do you wish you could listen at your convenience? Well, we can help you out with that one. Become a late nighter without the late nights and subscribe. Become a late nighter for just $5 a month. That's right, 5 bucks a month for the paranormal, the unknown, The known, but most important, the truth. Go to www.LateNightInTheMidlands.com and subscribe right away to become a late nighter and help keep the LNM Radio Network on the air. Are you a late nighter? Well, if not, here is one more reason to join the family. We have added the Late Nighters Forum to LateNightInTheMidlands.com and it is open for discussion of our many topics and guests. Now you have a place where you can share your thoughts and ideas with the entire Late Nighter community. So become a Late Nighter by subscribing on our website, LateNightInTheMidlands.com, and start leaving your mark on the Late Nighter community now. The LNM Radio Network offers a moderated chat room at www.LateNightInTheMidlands.com. Just click the chat and listen page from the drop-down menu at the top of any page on the website, or click the Listen Live button at the top of the homepage at www.LateNightInTheMidlands.com. Attention LNM Radio Network listeners, did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the LNM Radio Network by calling 605-562-4203? No smartphone app or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 605-562-4203. 4203 to listen to the LNM radio network on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Is there proof of God's existence in our government's records? Author Jose Calazo brings his years of research into this stunning question to light with his new book. Discover how new and experimental technologies may change our world forever and uncover monumental proof and answers to mankind's greatest questions in God does exist. No more nuclear testing and more. You could find Jose Colazo's book, America's New Slavery, on Amazon.com. Become a late nighter without the late nights. And subscribe now to help Late Night in the Midlands bring you the best guests with the best information. Hey, late nighters. I have a secret I want to share with you. What if I told you there's a way to hear some of our show content free on YouTube? Well, it just so happens there's a guy who is honest and supports Late Night in the Midlands big time. And he owns a YouTube channel I highly recommend. Non-Human Entities. Yes, Non-Human Entities. And if you do not have a pencil handy, no sweat. You can just click one of the many banners on our website. Non-Human Entities. That's non-human entities. Again, just look for them on YouTube or click the banner on LateNightInTheMidlands.com for non-human entities. On the east coast of the United States, from the capital city, Columbia, South Carolina, you're listening to Late Night in the Midlands with your host, Michael Vera. To talk to Michael Vera, dial 803 392 
or 566 or around the world on Skype. Just use Skype ID LNM Radio. And, uh, yeah, you know, no matter pretty much wherever you are, you're able to hear my voice if you really want to. Late Night in the Midlands, uh, worldwide. And uh, we're also carried on uh, some of our affiliates. That is AM and FM Radio, uh, where you can listen to us. Uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, 1620 AM, 100.5 FM. And in uh, Warham, Massachusetts, on WAFR, 87.5 FM. As a matter of fact, they carry us live. Uh, K98 Talk, SHR Media, and of course our very own, the LNM Radio Network. Uh, that just continues to grow and grow and grow, and I thank everybody for their support, and I wish I could be in there in that chat room with you tonight, uh, but unfortunately I can't, but uh, we'll try to get this taken care of so I can at least spend Friday in there with you. I had issues last night, switched out computers, and, well, now this one's kind of accidentally uh, password and forget. You know, sometimes people... They, they put passwords on things, and then they forget. Why would you not? I don't know. Why not? I, I mean, I've got all my stuff is is mental. It's in my head, and it's also written down. Um, but not at my desk, CIA and FBI, so don't come in looking for it. All right, so we're going to get back to things I've got. David Serretta with me. He is linked up on LateNightInTheMidlands.com. I hope you'll go and visit his website. As a matter of fact, I hope you'll go and visit his Vimeo pages as well. Uh, he's got some videos there, and uh, everything he says is making total sense. I mean, is it not? Folks, you've got to have some questions, and I'm sorry I can't pull them in out of the chat room tonight, but you're welcome to call in, 803-392-4566. The number's on the website. You can call in using Skype also, and I hope you'll become a late-nighter so that you can help us help you and bring you the best guests with the best information each and every night here on the L&M Network. So let's get back to it, David. Uh, so is is that really what they're doing? I mean, are they trying to build um, kind of like a cage to trap our souls as well, do you think? Well, John Lear, um, I had conversations with John Lear has, you know, from the Lear Aircraft family has had conversations with me where he's been proven that there's a black box on the dark side of the moon where this actually happens, where souls are trapped. And what's interesting about that is the the ancient Hindus have a philosophy that the astral body is not powerful enough to travel anywhere beyond Earth and the moon. It's kind of bound to that region even in the afterlife and that you needed your your causal body which is your light body in in their philosophy which is same the same in mystic christianity as the chrism to go much further to become a free luminous entity and that's what's amazing about that is that in the hindu system in the buddhist system you're not guaranteed a causal or light body until you do the practices or you become a very good person radiating from your heart center. You don't necessarily have to do specific meditations. You just simply have to be a very, very good resonant person to to get your light body activated at the moment of death or before death. And if you experience your light body before death, you go into states of rapture and ecstasy and very high-frequency states, and you see visions. Now, for the Egyptians... They had actually the one, two, three, four different bodies. The ka was basically your double. It, it's really the same as the astral body. It, it's, it's very limited in what it can do even after death. In, in fact, even after death, it still craves food. The Tibetan Buddhists call the equivalent of that the a person becomes a hungry ghost because they're they're still bound to a very small region and they crave food and all the things that senses wanted, including sex, but they can't have that because they don't have a body and they have to wait till they get another one. And if they weren't a very half-decent soul, the chances of them getting another body are not very good unless they're going to be born in very bad circumstances. For the Egyptians, the second body is called the Ba, the B-A, 
which is another spiritual body seen as the human-headed bird hovering over the deceased at the time of death. And this is seen in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And that's kind of the next level of of graduation of spirit. And then there's an auk, which is similar to the ankh. But the auk is basically a soul who can transfigure and survive and live with the god goddess realms. Now, the Tibetan Buddhists would say that that's much, that's a very good offer if you see a soft, milky white light when you die, then you're gonna you're you're gonna gain entrance to the demigod goddess realms and, and have amazing pleasures, an amazing life for an incredibly long time. But most Buddhists uh, they they reject that because they want to come here to suffer because inside of human suffering is this seed that can give them the nirvana, the superluminal state. And they can't get the nirvana very easily in the god realms and goddess realms because there's too much pleasure there, too much um, amazing sex and food and and other pleasures to travel and fly around and craft and live disease-free for, you know, tens of thousands of years. And the final body in the Egyptian system is the Ma'at Keru, which is really the, the same thing as the superlumined state. Your heart is weighed against the Ma'at, which is the sky goddess, the, which is cosmic consciousness. And if your heart is too heavy... You basically just you don't graduate. Your your heart is devoured by some kind of a monster. But that's that's really all symbolic. You can't really see the devouring as as an actual act. It's more of it, it gets consumed because you don't really have a heart because you're not a loving person, and you didn't follow the teachings of Christ properly. You now, what's amazing about that system is that Jesus teaches forgiveness for the purpose of not having a heavy heart when you die. So you may have had some horrible things happen to you, but if you hang on to those things and you're carrying the resentment and you don't forgive yourself for carrying them, then you have a heavy heart and you're going to weigh too much. And when you die, you're going to be hanging on to that heavy stuff and you're not going to let it go and you're not going to, you're not going to make it. I am and very, so very forgiving. And I, under, you know, where you're coming from with that, it's very true. Uh, you know, if, if you hold grudges, I mean, you let things like that bother you, it does get heavy on the heart. And what's interesting when they say that mostly the Kings and Queens could, were the only ones that could get a ba, the second body, and one thing that's kind of ironic about it is that they live a, a relatively stress-free life because they don't have to work like slaves in the mine pits, right? They're, so they, they tend to be more lighthearted, and it's easier for them to ascend. But that's only the second body. To, to get the, the Ak or the Ma'at Keru in the Egyptian system is very equivalent. You, you, see, you see different symbols and languages in the different religions, but you'll see the same thing. You'll see the seven levels of the light you'll see the eighth and the ninth reserved for super beings and that's consistent in in deep buddhism as well so it's very very much the same there there is really not a lot of differences there's there's differences in the techniques to attain the light body but what's amazing what i found is all of them use breath remember god breathed god's spirit into adam's nostrils and made out of an, a living soul. So the breath is key in most religious practices, doing special breathing techniques, which I teach people in my course. And the second is the toning and the use of sound. And, and the Hindus use mantras, which are words that produce certain frequencies that cause your chakras to, to resonate. And in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, it said that the mantra Om contains all other mantras. It, and the mantra Om comes from the sound of the sun, believe it or not, in, in, the, in the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda, which is probably one of the, the Rig Veda and the Pyramid Texts, are probably the oldest surviving manuscripts from the previous great epoch in, in human history. There's not much written that is older than those two. And it's debatable which of the two is really older. Because depending on who you talk to and which scholar you talk to, the Rig Veda could go easily go back 10,000 years, like B.G. Siddhartha says. So you, what you have are systems of breathing and sound and then observing in silence, holding a posture to attain this activation of your light body. And what's missing today 
in in the new Christianity, which came from the Europeans and came to the Americas, is is the actual methods for doing that. I mean, we lost it. We we basically created a codependent religion where we said all you have to do is get baptized and and practice forgiveness and be a good person and you're a good Christian. You're going to go to heaven. And the real Christian manuscripts say otherwise. They say that you actually have to become a resonant human being. You have to do... I mean, the purposes of toning isn't like... Like, when you tone, you feel incredible. I, I can't describe how naturally high you get when you do these tones. You, you hear tones in your headphones, you use your voice to sing that exact pitch, and you'll feel this shimmering inside of you. And when you're done, you just feel excellent. You is, feel amazing. Is is this why, I mean, you could, like, uh, for me, I'll go to the ocean and be in a spot where there's no one else around, just me in the water, and and it's like it is like the frequency changed. I mean, it's just it's such a great feeling. I mean, is that well, yeah? Because like for example, if you're barefoot at the beach, your feet are plugged into the earth, and the earth is producing a very relaxing seven point eight three hertz. Depending on where you go on the planet, it changes a little bit, but that is very relaxing. And interesting in the music scale that we discovered in the pyramid and the other sacred sites in the mathematics is all these sounds exist in nature. So the very, very low sounds might be like thunder or the wind blowing. And then, you know, bird singing is, you know, I've actually taken a meter and listened to bird singing and watched the frequencies of birds. And now they say dolphins can tone higher than a hundred thousand Hertz in the old days. It depended on how good your equipment was, right? You didn't know how high these dolphins could really go, but the most wide range of frequencies in a single living being would have to be the dolphin. The dolphin is the most has the most advanced scale of frequencies within it of any any being on earth. <clears throat> There's really nothing like them. Even birds frequencies don't go that high and and don't go as like dolphins can emit very low frequencies as well as very very high ones. So they're incredibly advanced tonally. And I think when we sang in church and when we sang together in circles, we were creating a lot of resonance. But the pitch that you sang at, if it wasn't perfect, then you were causing a little bit of distortion in your nervous system. And that's why, like when Jesus teaches the seven sacred tones to be chanted 22 times each, and 22 divided by 7 is pi, you know, the resolution of a circle. It's Egyptian pi, which is almost exactly the same as our pi. And we know that Jesus is speaking in a language of geometry and ratio and, and mathematics when he when he does that. But we know that he, you would have to traditionally in the old world learn from an oral master. You couldn't just sing vowels on your own because your pitch would be wrong. So you would have to learn your pitch from a teacher. But the teacher today is actually the frequency itself because we know that the frequency itself produces a certain pitch that is perfect or not perfect. And if it's perfect, then you use your voice until you get it as close to what you're hearing as you can. And when you get close in my course, you start to hear this vibration inside of your nerves and you feel this beautiful resonance. And it's also interesting, I find, because my wife was trained as a jazz singer and an opera singer. When she tones the high-pitched tones, it's so beautiful. It's angelic. You hear this pulsing. And I can't go that high. You know, men tend to, not all men and all, not all women. Of course, there's exceptions. But my voice tends to do the low frequencies really nicely. But I can't, I can't sing really high. So then what I do is I, I make other sounds to try to match the high-pitched sounds in the back of my throat. And, and it's really fun stuff because when you start to tone or do vibrational work on yourself, you start to go into deeper and deeper states of peace and deeper and deeper states of illumination in yourself. But you can do it in nature. Like there, there are people, you know, and there are systems, even in the, the Native American systems, where they could just commune with nature and listen to those sounds and partake of those sounds. And their drum beats were matching the very, very low tones. And they could really relax you. Very long drum beats could put you into a very deep, altered state of consciousness. 
And then there's other instruments that they use that could take them into much higher states. And then they do the dancing, you know. So we all have within our religions a system that's designed to illuminate from within. But when we lose that and we get lazy and we just think, I just have to be baptized and I'm guaranteed into heaven. You see, we, we lost the true meaning of spirituality is to is to reach heaven here and now, to be in heaven right here and right now and create our world from our hearts and from that state. And you'll find that like even the Egyptians, when we say they weighed the heart, see, we look at that as a physical weighing of a physical heart as some barbaric act. But it's symbolic, right? It's an emotional thing. You're weighing, you know, a heavy heart or a light heart, right? Yeah. And it's if you forgive the worst things, I mean, I've had horrible things happen to me in my life. Very unfair things. You know, mm -hmm. I wrote this book face to face with Jesus Christ on all my experiences, and my publisher stole the whole thing from me. He made me give him twenty thousand dollars of my tree planting, hard earned labor money to publish it, and then he took it. Wow. And and he's never and Amazon won't even give it back to me. They won't even I've written them. I said, That's my book. He took it and they said, Well, it belongs to him. Well, with all due respect, twenty thousand dollars can get you a good ass kicking. <laughs> yeah. Really. I mean if that was me, I told you that money don't grow on trees. <laughs> well no, for, I was a tree planter. I mean, I would save, you know, twenty thousand dollars a year working six months planting fifteen hundred trees a day and my body is like it's so in so much pain when I end a season of six months tree planting. I just want to pass out for a month, and and heal and recover the pain and the bruises in my body. Well, he he's and, he's making bad. I mean, isn't he uh, pulling bad frequencies towards himself, being like that? So that's what you do when you forgive. When you forgive someone, you just say, you know, you have your karma with God. You're going to have to work it out with whatever you did that was unjust. But I'm going to let it go. Because I don't want to carry it in my heart because I don't want that pain ruining my life in the here and now and the hereafter. Because, and it's terrible. I've had worse things than that happen to me. You know, I've had all of my movies stolen by other people, put on YouTube and monetized. My movie, Quantum Communication, was renamed Mind Science Kept Hidden by, and by somebody else. And they got... You know, tens of millions of views. They keep changing their name. I tell them to take it down. They change their name, put it up again, and they're making money. And from what I understand from the 30 million views that film had that I made with my partner Jim Law, they made more money than we ever made when we sold the DVD. And see, David, I, I, I'm glad that they you're br I'm glad you're bringing this up because I was telling listeners about how I was fighting against piracy with my shows and stuff. They do it all the time, and and people don't understand the severity of that. Well, even like I didn't know you could create a YouTube channel and actually make decent money on your content. Oh, yeah, they'll take they what they do is take you take any mention of you and all that out and they'll use your yeah, yeah, they do. They put their own ads in and they, they make, put their own ads in. And YouTube doesn't know the difference. If you try to call anybody at YouTube, you can't get anybody in the phone and then that person can say, "Hey, this is my movie. Prove it." And meanwhile, you know, they take it down and they change their channel name and they put it up somewhere else and they monetize it. And they did this for years yeah. with several of my movies. And and we had to actually shut down our DVD production business. I couldn't afford to make any more movies because it costs money, serious money, to make a movie in the first place. Because you got to travel and interview people and edit. you got to pay your rent and your food and your family while you're working. And... And so you have a budget, and then you got to recoup the budget before you're making a dime. And and we did. We were making you know decent money on our DVDs. It wasn't huge. You know, we were my wife and I were living on probably forty thousand a year in those days. But now we had that taken away from us. It I can't make movies anymore because because nobody respects them. They just take the DVD and put it up on a channel, and they call it their own. And and nobody respects my stuff. I, f I, I feel for you. I really do. Because what happens is really they make tons more money than you could ever dream of making on your own stuff. And me, I mean, I at one time, I had eight years where all my content was free. And then I my eyes were open to what was happening on YouTube. And I'm seeing people who are making thousands and thousands of dollars off my show. And here I am giving it free. That 
pissed me off, but yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know either, Mike. I didn't know that you could monetize it and make any money. I thought they must make a hundred dollars a month on this stuff, and it wasn't worth my time anymore. So then I tried putting uh, my Mona Lisa's Little Secret DVD on Vimeo for a dollar fifty rental, and only ten people rented it. So, and I sold probably. 2,000 DVDs on that film when, when we had our DVD business. We don't have it anymore because it's, it's not worth it. Nobody buys DVDs anymore. So, you know, that's it's they won't pay $1.50. They won't pay 50 cents, but they'll they'll love to watch it free. Now now I know that I can monetize it on on, on uh, YouTube, so I'm going to put my Mona Lisa's Little Secret film on YouTube any day now. It's going to be monetized with commercials. And and we'll see how it works. Like if it works and it's worth it, then I can go back into production. And if, if people send donations for me to help me make my films, then I can do it. But I know one thing: my films, like Evidence, the case for NASA UFOs, came out when it was Google Video, and we had tens of millions of free views of that film. It killed the DVD sales right at the gate. We only reco- recovered the the physical cash cost to make that DVD. And the the DVD sales tanked, but everybody was obsessed with evidence the case for NASA UFOs free. And it wasn't us. We didn't put it up. Somebody else did. And they monetized it, but we didn't know how to do that. And then and then we told them to take it down, and then it ended up in pieces all over the Internet. So that <clears throat> that's what people do. And those people have their karma to deal yeah, with, with the when they die, you know, what What did you do for a living? Well, I stole everybody's films. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what exactly. Do gonna, <laughs> where do you think you're going to go? Anywhere high? I, I don't think so. But but I can't hold... You see, that's what the spiritual law says. I have to keep forgiving. forgiving well, forgiving. I, I think that at some point their karma will be probably they'll have to come back and some kind of community service they're going to have to perform for, for what yeah. they've done. I, that's what I think. I've got a question here. From the chat, we tried to take calls, but I think because we haven't uh, accepted each other on on Skype, I think that has uh, some oh. privacy issue. I think is kept from the calls coming in, but that that's okay. Uh, we've got. Uh, can you ask uh, David what might one do to try to remember dreams better? Uh, better. Any recommended tones or breaths or or other? Well, I mean that's a huge effort and and my meditation course um was 26 lessons lessons per year including the toning and the breathing exercises and a lot of learning is uh, on my website at davidstrader.net it's called quantum regenesis i mean you're not going to learn how to do this just because i give you a tip i could give you a simple tip which is when you're dreaming and you're asleep you're aware that you're dreaming but if you don't tell your conscious mind the dream from the subconscious before you move your body if you move your body and wake up you won't remember the dream but if you stay still in your bed and replay the dream in your from your subconscious into your conscious and then you might have to play it back two or three times you'll remember a lot of it Mm -hmm. okay all right and uh um, you you had mentioned opening uh, like portals and things like that before, and I wanted to get your your thoughts on CERN. And then after that, of course, you can have the floor to get out anything that you'd like uh, before we finish up here. Well, you see, temples were made of semiconductive stone material, and when certain activations of those electrons got moving, the temple would produce a frequency which opened a portal to um, a particular god or goddess and or a particular realm. <clears throat> and they're mathematically calculated, these temples, to produce these frequencies. So if you were meditating inside of the pyramid or... And many people who have slept in the, in the king's chamber in the pyramid have reported amazing visitation stories, then, then that's what those things were for. And and where my new work is going with my new book is showing you the exact frequencies of all the sacred sites all over the world and how, with a device, you can transmit that exact frequency in your house 
so that you can work with that frequency behind sleep and, and have an experience with that the purpose of that temple. But when you come to CERN and you come to HARP, you're coming to people who are using atomic energy and frequencies that have no real destination point because they're not that organized the way they're doing it. <clears throat> the way they're doing it is they're just trying to slam matter together with more and more energy to to see what everything is made out of. But they're not working with frequency and energy together to open a proper portal that leads to a specific destination. And there's a lot of people that use frequency healing devices that will just put 5 hertz in your body, for example. And 5 hertz doesn't mean anything because it has no no resonant location in the solar system. For example, like many of the nine planets and the moonlets around the planets have very specific wavelengths and frequencies that have very specific purposes to your consciousness and your potential consciousness. And a lot of the temples, including the, the temple at Delphi in Greece, were designed with dimensions to produce frequencies that would lead to a destination. And what I'm doing now is I'm calculating the electromagnetic frequencies of those temples as opposed to their acoustic frequencies, which are acoustic frequencies are nowhere near as powerful as the electromagnetic frequencies emanated by the electrons in the stone, in, in the material. And, and there's there's an inner frequency and an outer frequency to the temple. And if they're, the temples are made out of very thick walls of stone, like Solomon's temple, they'll trap the resonant frequency inside of the cavity. And this is a huge subject. But um, that's what my new book that I'm just working on now. And I'm not looking for a publisher. I'm just going to make the book in a PDF or a, a printed on Amazon, you know, printed on demand most likely is how it's going to go. So when you read it, you'll not only in the end get the frequencies, but I'll show you how to use a simple inexpensive device and it'll train you how to plug that device into a transmitter and start transmitting those those frequencies into your space. So, but, but you know, HARP and the U.S. government, I don't think they're that intelligent. I don't think they know which frequencies lead to the real beautiful places. I, I think they're very, they're very crude, like cavemen and women who are behind these programs. And they're, they're opening up portals and they're playing dice because they don't know the numbers that they're putting into their portals. And so anything could come through. You could get some really messed up warfaring, you know, ETs. Yeah. You could get some, you could get a really good one or a really bad one because you don't know what you're doing. You got, and when God would tell a prophet to make a temple with specific dimensions. And in the case of of Ezekiel, the angel is telling Ezekiel that you have to make a staff, I think it's six cubits long, and then you make the wall surrounding the temple complex multiples of that staff. And you, you have to know what a true royal cubit is first before you know what those dimensions are going to be, and then you can calculate the frequencies. And that's what I'm doing in this new work. And I'm finding that all of God's temples have the same numbers in them. They all have the same numbers. And there's a reason for that, because those are the frequencies to communicate with the angelic and with with the, with the super illuminated beings rather than the dark ones. So it, it, it really matters to have the exact frequencies. And I have these frequencies exact to 10 decimal places. Fascinating. So, uh, David, we're getting down uh, to the last few minutes. Uh, if you want to get, uh, I have them posted on the website, but we have people listening from all over the place. So, uh, if you want to give out those websites, uh, go right ahead. Anything, any appearances yeah. you've got well, coming up? Go ahead. What I what I have for people is I have crystal pendants that are treated with these harmonic frequencies, and crystal and any type of gem is very good at holding vibrations if you know how to program it um, because of vibrating the atoms in the crystal lattice. They, they have infinite memory. And so when people wear these things, we've tested the aura before and after. People wear my pendants. You can see a difference almost every time. Now, the odd person is so stubborn, they say, I don't want to believe this thing works, and I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to put it on, and my aura is not going to change. And their intention is so powerful, their aura doesn't really change much. But then we found also that um, 
by having a transmitter in your house, and I have these great pyramid angle vortex transmitters called mantra transmitters on my site at David Sarita, S E R E D A dot net. And the mantra transmitters can go under your bed or next to your bed or, you know, in your meditation area. And there's a whole menu of pyramid frequencies, planet frequencies, infinities, golden ratio frequencies that you can transmit into your house to clean out your house or your workspace from all the Wi-Fi. And like, you know, I hate to say this, but go, if you live in a tower, you're working in an office tower, you live in an apartment and go look for your Wi-Fi signal and see how many other signals are right on top of your brain. Yeah, and when when you see that list, that massive list, when you live in Manhattan, and you go, all of those microwaves, all of them are going into my nervous system. I'm telling you, you need one of these things in your house to put your own frequencies of your own choice back into your environment because you are being slammed with with everybody's Wi-Fi signal in your nervous system. You have no idea what it's doing to you. It is just warping you. So you, you, the, oh. I believe the future that there's the future in these devices to clean out the electrical field pollution in your house because it's affecting your aura. It's affecting your your body electric. You're an electrical being. Just pick up a voltmeter, the positive and negative nodes on your two fingers, and your thumb and your index fingers, and you'll see voltage because you're electrical. And that means if you're electrical, then you're frequency inductible. Luc Montagne, who won the, the Nobel Prize for the AIDS virus, um, he proved that human DNA reads frequencies. He proved it. And he proved that it could read really low frequencies. And what's interesting about that in the X-Files is infrasound, which in Agent Mulder um, states is I-N-F-R-A sound, infrasound, are low frequencies that you don't hear and, and Luke Montagne found that the DNA reads the low frequencies like a little antenna in the middle of all your cells. And therefore, it's reading everything that you're being, you're being imposed by. And that means natural frequencies as well as unnatural ones. And the unnatural ones can cause great harm to your different spiritual bodies as well as your physical body. So you got to get shielded, protected. And I found, you know, I studied metals, different metals that can block all the signals coming from out there. But there's the only metals that can really block everything are tungsten. And tungsten in sheet would cost you $100,000 to, to line your house with it. Wow. And then you're going to block out all the cosmic rays too. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to block out the solar energy because natural EMF, and harmonic EMF is good for you. That, that's photosynthesis. That's how electromagnetic fields, the, the sun is electromagnetic energy. So if you block out those frequencies, you're dead. <laughs> so you can't, you can't really do that. You can't really use materials to block everything. You just have to reharmonize everything with your own um, frequencies going into your own house. And that's the only way I believe that people are going to be sane in the future because these signals are going to get more and more and more. There's going to be more and more Wi-Fi, more and more signals, stronger and stronger signals, and more and more specific frequencies going into your head like the X-Files. So that isn't, that isn't science fiction, folks. That's, they're, they're trying to tell you something. That's right. I agree. And one more question we got here. Uh, Iris passed it off to me. Uh, can you ask if harmonics from a guitar work, or does it have to be uh, notes? I think he's got here. Well, it's possible to tune a guitar to the pyramid scale. Yes. In in my course in lesson ten, there's a PDF that gives you all the numbers of all the frequencies, and all you need to do is get a frequency meter and tune your tar guitar, which is six strings, so you could tune six out of ten notes to whatever you want to on, on whatever octave you want to on the scale. I mean, I'm not sure how what latitude there is in guitar strings to get these exact frequencies, but it should come pretty darn close. All right. Well, David, I thank you so much. Uh, we, we mustn't wait so long. I just said this to the last couple of guests here uh, this past uh, week. Because yeah, it's, I mean, I love going on your show. Um, 
Yeah, so, absolutely. We'll we'll have to get you back very soon, like in the next month, uh, maybe. Yeah. And then and, and well, when I finish this book, when I finish this book, I'm talking about. There's a part of the book I haven't told you yet, but I, I'll reveal it when the book is ready, and I hope to have it ready in a month. All right. Well, sounds good. We've got you I'll, linked up on the website, and we'll keep you there in our archive as well. Thank you. All right, Mike. Thanks. All right. Have, have a good night, my friend. And uh, too. yeah, I'm looking forward to having you on again. What a what a fountain of information, folks. Uh, David Serretta. I I'll tell you, I really enjoy uh, conversations with David, and uh, he's just got so much to share. And uh, we do appreciate. Uh, him being on the show tonight. So, um, oh, and by the way, tomorrow night, folks, I have scheduled Tyler Hardy. Now, I don't know, uh, I haven't heard from him in the last few days, so uh, hopefully that goes as well. But if not, we've always got some kind of backup, but usually we do. And uh, so Tyler Hardy, and you might ask who he is. Well, back when I first started my show, uh, he was doing – um, well, kind of a video show on what was called Justin TV at the time. And, uh, you know, he's pretty outspoken. Uh, we got to talking. I liked what he had to say. And so, you know, we've kind of stood in touch and, uh, he's been on the show a few times. So we'll get into all kinds of things. Last time he was on, we talked about Edgar Casey. Uh, who knows? Uh, that might be where we go tomorrow night. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, hopefully everything works out. But uh, folks, David, again, he is linked up on our homepage at latenightinthemidlands.com. Uh, folks, I, I, I hope you enjoyed I think we've really kicked some butt this week. Uh, I'll tell you, each night has just been just so much it gets better. It's like every night is just fantastic. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But, I, you know, folks, I, I'm really enjoying it. I hope you are too. And I hope you'll stay tuned because there's more coming up after this show. Uh, Ira's got it going 24-7 here. Uh, folks, I thank you so much for joining us tonight on the Late Night in the Midlands and the LNM Radio Network. Uh, I ask that you keep your eyes posted to the sky because you never know what you might see and keep your ears posted to this broadcast because you never know what you might learn. Good night, everybody, and thank you so much.